Greetings, and welcome back to my little corner of YouTube. My name is Lindsay Pogue. I am the author of the dystopian and historical fantasy series, The Forgotten Lands, and you are about to listen to the third and final part of Dust and Shadow. Yes, there are two parts before this, so please be sure to look at the links below in the description so you can start at the beginning. All right, so Joe and Clayton's adventure is coming to an end. I hope you've had a good ride so far. This book is near and dear to my heart because I grew up a cowgirl and I love the sun. Perhaps not desert scale sun, but I do enjoy nature, the sun, and as you know, riding weather ravaged worlds. So I don't know what's more terrifying, riding blizzards and thinking about being stuck in the snow for the Savage North Chronicles or windstorms and sandstorms in the desert. It's hard to say, but here we go. Please like and subscribe and be sure to start at the very beginning. <laughs> I'll see you on the other side. Chapter 27, Joe. The iron gates are already open as the carriage arrives at the Cunningham's estate. Flaming lanterns light the road leading to the manor and the house is aglow from the inside out. I can almost imagine it in its grandeur with an elegant drive lined with noble trees instead of a winding trail of dust and rock that sends the carriage jostling at every bump and blemish in the road. Dinner with the Cunninghams. Who would have thought, I mutter, and Scarlet takes my hand in hers, giving it a squeeze. She eyes the lambent fire trail leading to the house. It's beautiful. I have a feeling Mrs. Cunningham went to a lot of trouble to make tonight perfect, especially after the wonderful birthday party she put together. My father and I exchange a wary look. Scarlet is too excited to remember how unfortunate that outing had ended. She looks to my father. Do you know Mrs. Cunningham as well as the marshal? She asks him. She seems so different than all of them, regal in her own way, like a true proper lady. I imagine what my father must be thinking as we stop in front of the house his wife was killed in, but his expression gives nothing away. He looks back and forth between us. I know little about her, he says. I can't help my surprise as I stare through the window, up at the craftsmanship that stands before me. It's nothing like our farmhouse that's been weathered by time, nor the cramped apartments and townhouses in sagebrush proper only a mile away. By the number of windows, I should think there are at least a dozen rooms, Scarlet whispers, and just as many chimneys. A couple of servants step out through the front door and make their way toward us. All the arched windows and ornate woodwork mark a bygone era all but forgotten. Even the steel shutters seem made for it. The servants open the carriage door, and when I step down, I find Clayton on the porch, peering down at us. His light brown hair is combed back, unlike his frazzled appearance the other day. He's presentable, with white linen sleeves billowing out from his leather vest. Somehow, with the dust and sweat washed away, I see what looks like a true gentleman standing before me, hand extended. Welcome, Miss Mason. His smile is so easy it's nearly contagious, and he takes my lace-gloved hand in his. Thank you, I say, and without reservation, he kisses the backs of my fingers with a bow, and I catch the weak scent of whiskey wafting from him. My heart double thumps in disappointment, and I realize I'd forgotten for a moment who it is I'm to marry. Clayton straightens to acknowledge my sister and father. I hope the road wasn't too rough, he says easily and gestures toward the house. It's much like any road around here, my father grumbles. Well, you're here now. Clayton smiles at me though it wavers a little, and I wonder if he's nervous. Shall we? My sister and mother are in the parlor. Skylar takes my father's arm as I hook mine through Clayton's, and in pairs we walk through the door. The foyer is four times the size of ours and boasts a grand staircase leading to a landing that splits into two wings of the house. The warm wood floors are worn but striking, and gilded candelabras rest on every surface in the room, ensuring there's enough light. A pretty maid collects my father's sand cloak, then looks from Scarlet to me. I'll take that, miss, she says with a slight bow. The way she looks at me with a small smile, her eyes lingering, confuses me. Mr. Mason, 
a soft voice says behind me. I turn around to find a kind-faced woman, almost cherub-like, smiling at us from the doorway. Miss Mason? Mrs. Cunningham steps into the foyer. Miss Scarlet? She bows her head. It's wonderful to see you again, my dear. She hurries over to me and takes my hands in hers and squeezes. And if I'm not mistaken, it's meant to be reassuring. She kisses one of my cheeks and then the other. You are breathtaking, as always. I bow, a bit stunned, and smile back at her. Thank you, Mrs. Cunningham. Thank you for being so warm and kind. I take in her topaz skirts and bustle. You look lovely as well, I say in truth, though it feels forced to pretend this isn't one of the strangest, most uncomfortable circumstances I've ever been in before. I tremble as I wait for the marshal to step into the room. Mrs. Cunningham welcomes my father and sister. She even gets a slightly bashful grin from my father when she compliments him on his mustache. Very few men can grow a proper one, she says. Your home is so beautiful, Scarlet whispers with awe as she peers around the entry. Mrs. Cunningham laughs. Thank you, child. I have little to occupy my time, so I spend it working on the house, with help, of course. She leans closer to Scarlet. We ladies must have hobbies as much as any man, am I right? She looks at me with a wink, and I grin. I hear you are quite the tinkerer, Mrs. Cunningham says, taking my hand in hers. I should like to learn more about it. Oh, but later. She peers around at my family. Please, come have a seat in the parlor until dinner is ready. I glance back at Clayton, in stilted conversation with my father, as his mother commandeers me into the other room. It is three times the size of our sitting room and lavishly decorated. Gold-framed mirrors hang strategically on the walls, intermittent with portraits and paintings. Pieces of furniture, upholstered in florals and rich-colored fabrics, are arranged in groupings throughout the room, with clocks and books and candelabras spread out among them. An elaborate tapestry depicting a family lounging on a rolling green hill next to a stream is the most striking. How ironically appropriate. Come, Mrs. Cunningham says, ushering me further in. There's so much I would like to know about you. She pats the seat beside her as she sits on the ruby red sofa. Would you care for a glass of devil's juice, Miss Mason? Jack's gin or whiskey, perhaps? Clayton asks, his eyebrows lifting playfully. Juice will suffice, thank you, though it sounds much more ominous than whiskey. Unfortunately, not as strong, he says with a quirk of a smile. I'll help you, my father offers all too eagerly, and he steps over to the bar cabinet with Clayton. Mrs. Cunningham takes my hand, chuckling under her breath, and asks for a glass as well. Of course, Scarlet is drawn immediately to the curtains and the wallpaper, running her fingers over them as if she's never seen anything so beautiful. My son tells me your little farmhouse is quite charming. Mrs. Cunningham says, and though I know she's lying, her face lights up politely, the light from the oil lamps softening her face. She's a gentle creature with smiling gray eyes and a bow-shaped mouth, so different than her son and husband. I wouldn't say charming, but it's comfortable in the way we like it. It's not as stuffy as this place, Clayton mutters, and I can see why he might think that. I can barely picture him growing up in this house. It almost feels too big and lonely. My son does not share my taste for fine things. Well, Scarlet says, I think this house is absolutely lovely. My father hands her a crystal glass of red wine. Thank you, Miss Scarlet, Mrs. Cunningham says happily. It's nice to know I'm not the only one with a semblance of taste. She winks at me. Are they already here? Kitty saunters into the room and stops short when she sees us. Oh, look, you have arrived. Her tone is just as scornful as expected. How wonderful to see you all again, so soon. I don't miss the warning glare that both Clayton and his mother give her, but she doesn't seem to notice. She looks pretty in her teal gown and feathers, but her expression leaves something to be desired. 
Where is Miss Isabel? Scarlet asks happily, always willing to break the silent discomfort. Upstairs with the nanny, readying for bed, Clayton says. She's feeling a bit under the weather today. He clears his throat and hands me a glass of spirits. I'm not sure where my father is. Now, before we eat and drink too terribly much, Mrs. Cunningham starts, I want you to know that you will have nothing to worry about in regard to the wedding. I don't want you to fret in the slightest. Mother, Clayton says in a low warning and hands a glass to her. We're not discussing that tonight, he says quietly. My stomach rises to my throat and I take a sip from my glass. Then another. Oh, never mind then, she amends. I'm sorry. She nods to my dress. I hear you're fond of purple? Well, uh, yes, I am. Clayton thought so, she explains, and butterflies and books. He shakes his head, rubbing his temple, thoroughly embarrassed. I try to refrain from smiling wholeheartedly at his endearing discomfort. I should thank you, Mrs. Cunningham, for helping Clayton choose such lovely gifts to bring over the other night. Quick, heavy footsteps break up the easy atmosphere as the marshal strides into the room. Good evening, he says with expected ease, and he smooths out his coat. I'm sorry to be late. I had some business to take care of. I stand with bated breath as he draws closer. I'm not sure I'm ready for this. But apprehension turns to horror, and I take a step back from him. His shirt is splattered with red. Is that blood? Clayton is beside me before I realize it. Father? Marcus, are you all right? Mrs. Cunningham says as she rises to her feet. The marshal stares down at his shirt. Then his eyes meet mine. I think I even see regret in them. I'm sorry, Miss Mason. How inappropriate of me. I didn't mean to upset you. He bows. If you'll excuse me. He turns and leaves the room without ceremony, and we stand in pregnant silence. Suddenly feeling feverish, I sit down on the love seat and try to gather myself. That wasn't a very promising start to the evening, Mrs. Cunningham says dryly. I apologize for my husband. She doesn't bother offering us an explanation. We all know he was likely torturing someone. I swallow the contents of my glass until there is nothing left and hand it to Clayton for another. Mrs. Cunningham prattles on, asking us if we'd like a tour of the house before dinner, but I don't pay attention. All I can think about is what the marshal was doing only moments before he wandered in. Did he kill someone or simply beat them within an inch of their life? Once again, the horrors of being a part of this family overshadow any benefit I can see to being Clayton's wife. Shutting my eyes, I force myself to take a deep breath. I hear slow, careful footsteps and open my eyes to find Clayton standing beside me, my refilled wine glass proffered to me. I'm sorry about that, he says and crouches down to meet my gaze. Are you all right? His furrowed brow and the pinch of his mouth endears him to me a little bit more. Even as the odds continue to stack against him, Clayton is doing everything he can to make me feel welcome and as comfortable as he can. I'll be fine, I tell him. I realize, like him, I should have had the forethought to settle my nerves with a few drinks at home before coming here. Don't wander too far, though, I tell him. I'll need another soon. I tip my glass to him, earning a smile. Clayton winks at me. Only a few agonizing minutes pass of my waiting to see what happens next before a servant comes in to announce dinner. Oh, good, Mrs. Cunningham says. Clayton takes his mother's arm and then his sister's in his, my father, sister, and I following them into the dining room. Our footsteps are muted by the oriental rugs as we step inside. Much like the rest of the house, the room is grand. A candle chandelier hangs in a teardrop over the large oval table the gilded maroon wallpaper glinting in the chandelier light. It's not always like this, Clayton says, barely loud enough to hear. I'm not surprised to find my name on a small folded card at the setting next to his, and I take the chair beside him. No, it's quite magnificent. I glance over the table at my sister and father as they take their seats. I jump a little when a servant begins to scoot my chair in for me. Oh, thank you. 
I peer back at him. He's an older gentleman with beady blue eyes and drawn features. Kitty catches my gaze next, a cross expression pinching her face, but I quickly look away. There is room at the table for at least a dozen guests, and the table is draped in a lace tablecloth and dressed in fine china. There are pastry platters and relish trays and some sort of pound cake creating an edible line down the center of the table. A white lily arrangement, the most luxurious I've ever seen, sits in the very center, and I reach out to touch their false petals. Immediately, I yank my hand back. They're real? Kitty smiles, almost as if she forgets she hates me so much. Yes, they are real, Mrs. Cunningham says, taking a sip from her water glass. Lilies are my favorite flower and one that is very difficult to grow here in all of this heat. But how? She has a greenhouse out back, Clayton reminds me. You should have seen how excited she was when she realized she'd finally have a reason to display them. His mother tisks him. You shouldn't embarrass your mother, I whisper playfully. Besides, I would be excited too. Clayton chuckles. My apologies, mother. The servants file into the room setting warm plates of quail braised in an herb sauce that fills my nose and smells like a dream. Mrs. Cunningham places her napkin in her lap. It's nice to have you all here. She motions for one of the servants to leave a water pitcher on the table. A throat clears in the hallway and the marshal walks in, his new outfit devoid of splattered blood. There's a sheen to his eyes that wasn't there before, but he smiles pleasantly enough and takes his place at the head of the table. I apologize again, both for being late and for having to step away. He nods to a servant for his glass to be filled. The whiskey, he tells him. He leans forward, stealing a pickle off the relish tray and peers at the room, though I notice he doesn't meet my gaze nor my father's. Why is everyone not eating? Please, begin. He rubs his chest and peers down at the feast in front of him. I wonder if it's not good enough for him, or perhaps they aren't used to fine dining like this. As genteelly as possible, I take my fork and knife in hand and cut into the quail, the meat moist and mouth-watering as I spear a piece onto my fork. I didn't realize I was even hungry in all the stomach-coiling conversation, but I nearly let out a groan as I taste the sauce gravy on my tongue. So, what have I missed? The marshal asks his demeanor more congenial and easier than expected. Anything exciting? There's a lull in the conversation, Clayton and his mother eyeing the marshal quite scathingly, so Kitty jumps to his rescue. I was just about to ask our guests if they are very artistic, she says. I'm not the only one surprised by this. We all stare at her, making her flush, and she lifts a shoulder and takes a sip of her devil's juice. Fleetingly, I wonder if it tastes anything like wine used to when grapes were plentiful. So, Kitty prompts, are you? She looks between Scarlet and me. Artistic? No, I'm not, I say easily, though Scarlet's sketches of her gowns are quite remarkable. I would imagine they're quite stunning, Mrs. Cunningham says with interest. I would very much like to see them sometime. You know, the process from start to finish. You do such exquisite work. Yes, of course, I would be honored. Scarlet blushes and takes a bite of her quail. And you, Miss Mason? Kitty asks, singling me out. What are your talents? I've heard you and your sister joking that you have none, though I'm sure that's not true. Well, I work well with my hands, I say, though the arts quite escape me. She likes to read, Scarlet tells her. And, Clayton intervenes, her sketches of buildings are quite good. I fidget under his praise. Your sister showed me the other day while we were waiting for you to return. Oh, I glance at Scarlet, wondering what other mischief they'd gotten into in my absence. What about you, Miss Cunningham? I ask Kitty. What is it that you like to do? I notice the pianoforte in the parlor. Yes, I do play a little, but painting is my preference. You paint? I can't imagine Kitty engaging in any pastime that might dirty her skirts or fingernails. She nods to the still life on the wall behind the marshal, a bowl of vibrant fruits I'm sure I've never tasted in my life. That's quite good. Kitty is very creative when she puts her mind to it, the marshal says flatly. 
though I dare say all of you are well accomplished. These days, it's the trades and the skills we learn working with our hands that are worth the most, at least as far as I'm concerned. He stares down at his plate. In his silence, I realize that a week or two ago, I would have rather died than sit at this table and listen to the marshal. Now, though he makes me uneasy, I'm not wholly uncomfortable. He peers into his glass before he takes a swig, equally uncomfortable. Anything else is frivolous, he says absently. The servants bring out bowls of soup and set one in front of each of us, but all I can do is watch Kitty. Her eyes shimmer and she rolls her shoulders back before she finally tears her injured gaze away from her disapproving father. Though I'm not sure he even notices it, his words clearly hurt Kitty. Her easiness vanishes as quickly as it appeared, leaving a scowl in its place. I was thinking, Mrs. Cunningham says more quietly, leaning over to Scarlet, that perhaps we should discuss what you might need for a certain dress. The marshal barks out a laugh. You're already planning? He swallows the last of the whiskey in his glass and asks for another. They are to be married soon, by your request, she says evenly. Are they not? The marshal barely spares me a glance before he looks at Clayton. I don't know, are you? His eyes are glassy with too much drink, but his confusion on the matter surprises me. Clayton's face reddens. It's clear something has passed between them before tonight. He squares his shoulders and looks his father in the eye. Yes, we are. Marshal Cunningham begins to clap, his smile too easy, too wide, as if he's putting on a show, perhaps even for himself. Congratulations. He shakes his head, then looks at my father. Who would have thought the Masons and the Cunninghams happily ever after in the end? Anger burns in my heart and cheeks as he makes a mockery of my family, my life, and the life he took from my mother. My father drops his utensils, clears his throat, and tosses his napkin onto his plate. He doesn't bother to excuse himself from the table before he exits the room. I stand to go after him, but Scarlet shakes her head. Leave him be, she tells me, and I know that she's right. Though my heart hurts for my father, I know he would rather be alone. Marcus, Mrs. Cunningham scolds. I glare at the marshal, and for the first time, he really looks at me. There is a shade of something in his eyes, regret or exhaustion, perhaps, but he quickly shifts his attention to the doorway. Clayton sets his elbows on the table with a clatter, his onion soup sloshing over his bowl. Is there no reprieve? He groans. Kitty looks between us all confusion crinkling her brow. Like Isabel, she clearly knows nothing about her father, our intertwined pasts, and the nightmare the Masons' lives have been because of him. We sit in awkward silence, only the marshal eating his meal with renewed vigor. He pours himself another drink. Someone say something, he demands. Mrs. Cunningham opens her mouth when a woman I've seen a couple of times in town hurries into the room. She's wearing a nightcap and apron, and she has a harried expression on her face. What is it, Charlotte? It's Isabel, Mrs. Cunningham. She's having another one of her fits. Like a gust of wind sweeping through the room, everything begins to rattle and clank. Clayton and his sister, mother and father all scoot their chairs out in a hurry, the dishes clanging as the table shakes. Mrs. Cunningham and the marshal hurry from the room first, Clayton following after. Then he looks back at me. Please excuse us, he says, and disappears from the dining room. Scarlet and I stare at one another, our expressions much the same, wide-eyed horror and confusion. I scoop my chair from the table and hurry out of the room. When I notice Clayton disappear down the hallway upstairs, I cross the entryway, Scarlet not far behind me. With hurried footsteps, we follow the sound of a rattling cough and hushed murmurs up the stairs and down the hall. We stop outside the little girl's bedroom, nearly bumping into a maid rushing out with a pail of water. Mrs. Cunningham sits on Isabel's white draped bed, her daughter wrapped in her arms as she chokes and wheezes. The marshal sets a tincture bottle on the dresser beside me. All of them stand around in horror, and none of them realize Scarlet and I are standing there. I reach for the bottle and sniff the contents. 
It's sour smelling and burns the inside of my nostrils. Fennel? I ask Scarlet, waving the vial beneath her nose. She frowns, nodding her head. Where did you get this? I ask the room, but Kitty is the only one to hear me. Dr. Henderson, she says, for her coughing fits. It's too harsh, I tell her and step further into the room. I grab Clayton's arm. He spins around, eyes alight with alarm. Clayton, you need to give her ginger water or tea. Isabel doesn't like ginger, the marshal says. Well, it's that or this, I say boldly and point to the red-faced child gasping for breath. Ginger tea will soothe her throat. Whatever is in this tincture is only aggravating it. Right now, her airways are inflamed and irritated, and she's overheating. I find the nanny in the room. Ginger tea, not too hot, I tell her, and she nods, hurrying from the room. Isabel coughs, each breath a chore. Mrs. Cunningham glances from the marshal, crouched beside her, to me. You need to cool her down, and she has to control her breathing, I tell her, pulling some of Isabel's blankets back. Clayton rushes to the other side of her bed to help me layer them at her feet. I grab his hand. Tell her to breathe with your mother, to listen to her heartbeat. She has to get her coughing under control. Izzy, Clayton says calmly, trying to refocus her attention on him instead of her panic. The little girl gags, struggling to breathe. Izzy, you have to calm down, he pleads. Try to breathe like mama, Izzy. He rubs her arm, slow and steady. The marshal shouts in the hallway for the ginger tea, and I reach for Kitty. Bring cool cloths for her forehead and chest, and if you have lemon, bring one to me. Kitty doesn't hesitate. She nods and rushes from the room. Isabel's eyes are closed as her mother rocks her against her chest, murmuring reassurances as her little girl chokes with each inhale. Scarlet grips my shoulder as we stand and wait. Chapter 28, Joe. Scarlet sleeps soundly in the bed beside me, but I can't keep my mind silent. While Isabel also sleeps soundly in her room down the hall, the image of her red face haunts me. I don't know how many times Clayton has watched his sister struggle simply to breathe, but I will never forget the fear and helplessness I saw in his eyes or the marshal's. I have to remind myself the marshal doesn't deserve my sympathy which is easy enough to do given how drunk my father was when Clayton found him. I've never seen father like that before. I'd never seen Clayton as authoritative as he was when the stable boy fessed up to getting my father drunk, either. Peering around the unfamiliar room, possible futures loom. I'm in a house that will soon be my home, though I hope Clayton will agree for us to live at the farm or somewhere else, at least. I know the marshal stirs somewhere beyond the walls. With a suppressed growl, I climb out of bed. Luxurious rugs are soft beneath my bare feet as I step into wool-lined slippers. Glancing back at Scarlet, I ensure she's still sleeping, then tiptoe to the door, slowly turning the knob. The strangeness of this house compels me to explore it. Stepping out of the bedroom, I pull the door shut behind me as quietly as possible. It's colder outside of the room, drafty and dark. The rooms here are too big, and despite being indoors, a chill runs down my spine and into my toes. I walk the landing, eyeing shadowed portraits of the Cunninghams, whose eyes I feel on me with each step. All of the men are different, some skinny with pointy noses, others faces as round as a wagon wheel, but all of them have one thing that strikes a tremulous chord somewhere deep down, their eyes dark and incisive, though the marshals were not dark tonight. As much as I try to understand the change in him, I can't. He got his jibes in at dinner, but the marshal seemed altered tonight. He'd been close to drunk when he arrived at the table, that much was clear, but he didn't seem the monster I've known most of my life, especially not after I saw the way he nearly crumbled as he put his daughter to sleep after two hours of sitting beside her bed in silent desperation. He said nothing afterward, retreating as quickly as he could out of sight. Hearing footsteps below, I peer down into the foyer. A candelabra is lit in the entry, and I catch a glimpse of a shadowy figure as it crosses the room. I wait with bated breath. 
suspended in a moment of panic and curiosity. It's as though the marshal can feel my gaze. His stalwart figure stops and he peers up at me, a stalking shadow in the night. I can't see more than a dull glint in his eye from the lamplight, but his gaze rests on me for a moment before he stalks into some dark crevasse of the house. When he's finally out of sight, I allow myself to breathe. A door creaks open down the hallway behind me, and another shadowed form steps out. Joe, Clayton whispers, and I nearly swallow my own tongue at the sight of his bare chest. What are you doing wandering around this late? He sounds a bit anxious, and his head dips as if he's eyeing me up and down. Is there something I can get you? I shake my head, uneasy despite his casualness as he takes a step closer. The pale light from his room casts him and his loose-hanging trousers in a more intimidating light than I'm used to. I glance down to where the marshal stood. My mind won't settle, is all. Can I get you something for your comfort? He asks, drawing another step closer, then another, until he's only a couple of feet from me. His eyes are dark, but I imagine their concern and the way they scour my face. I imagine his lips parted, about to say something, and then he reaches for me. I gasp, causing myself to choke and cough to catch my breath. Clayton grabs hold of my upper arm and leads me quickly into his bedroom, past the large wood-carved four-post bed to a bar table he has in the corner. I clear my throat as he thrusts a glass of water at me. Here, drink this. With a quick glance at him, I take a sip. It doesn't help that I'm in his room, alone with him, half naked in the middle of the night. I gulped down the water to busy my thoughts, then set the glass back on the bar. Thank you, I say hoarsely. I clear my throat, expecting him to escort me from his room, but he simply looks at me. His blue eyes are wide with worry, and I can't help the direction my gaze wanders next. Past the angle of his chin, down the tanned column of his neck, and then to his chest. Why, Miss Mason, he says, full of delight. You're flushed. I clear my throat again and turn away from him. Surely, of all the things you own, a shirt is one of them. He laughs quietly to himself and I hear rustling behind me. My apologies. After a moment, his voice is close against my ear. He smells of rich spices and beeswax. Is this better? Although I face the doorway, I can't quite force my feet to take me to it, so I save face and turn to him instead. A loose shirt covers part of his chest, though the neck V's down to the middle further than I'm comfortable with. I get the impression he's testing me on purpose, and I feel a strange thrill of anticipation. Well, since we're both awake, he says with the same openness and friendliness he greeted me with this evening, are you up for a game of gammon? The thought is actually appealing in my listlessness. I force my gaze from his face and glance around his room. Yes, I'd like that. A five-arm candelabra sits in the fireplace. It flickers and glows, bathing the room in amber. Clayton gestures for me to sit down at the table. Please, have a seat. I sit, realizing how different his room is from mine, how masculine. A carved wood canopy hangs over his bed, and save for holster and pistols discarded on the floor beside a pair of riding boots, nothing is out of place. Clayton pulls his chair to the table and picks up the dice from the alabaster backgammon board. The pieces are moved and spread around, as if he's been playing a game against himself. Are you sure you need a partner? I ask, unable to resist a smirk. It's more fun this way, I assure you. He steps over to a tall chest of drawers. Sleep seems to escape me lately. You mean with Isabel's fits? He pauses from pouring himself a drink. Yes, among other things. He glances at the board. So you play? It's been years, I admit, since the memory of playing with my mother, father, and sister has always been too painful. Then I'd say you're due for a game. Would you like a drink? Wine, perhaps, or a bit of brandy? I don't have the hard stuff you like, I'm afraid. I laugh. Shucks, no whiskey? I did take quite a shining to it at the dance. But juice is fine, thank you. He uncorks the juice jug 
and only the glug of wine into the glass fills the room. Thank you for what you did tonight, he says more seriously, and I'm sorry about my father. Actually, that's thoughtless of me, isn't it? You don't care what rare form my father is in. I know it's difficult for you to be here regardless. It's difficult, but I'm glad I could be here to help Isabel, I tell him, deciding the topic of his father is best left untouched. He brings me a glass of burgundy liquid, half full. As am I, he says softly. I can feel the heat of his body next to mine. Thank you for the wine, I say, and immediately take a sip. Clayton sets his glass of what I assume is brandy down, completely oblivious. Shall we then? Perhaps it would be a good idea to play in the sitting room, I say, regretting how desperate it sounds the moment I say it. Clayton grins. You're not worried about being alone with me, are you, Joe? He shakes his head, clearly amused. We would be alone in any part of the house, though it's warmer in here. He takes another sip of his drink and sets his glass down with more force than is necessary. But if you're more comfortable, he stands. No, it's fine, I tell him, waving for him to sit back down. Are you certain? I can tell he's trying to be a gentleman, even if it's clear he likes the comfort of his room. So do I. Swallowing thickly, I nod. Then shall we play? He begins to reset the board. I watch how deftly he sets the pieces around. Which color shall I be? I am assuming you have a preference given how much you play. Being that I generally play alone, I'm indifferent. He smiles again, only this time his eyes don't shift to the board. They linger on my face. His mouth intrigues me more than I know it should, and I clear my throat. All right, I'll be white. I can't say I'm surprised, he mutters. Glaring at him, I cross my arms over my chest. I feel like I should take offense to that. Clayton looks at me, unblinking. Then he runs his fingers through his hair. I apologize. It's been a long day. It's the brandy talking. Perhaps he should rest, I say, standing. But he reaches for my wrist. Don't go, he says. I'll behave. We haven't been alone all night. I wasn't aware you wanted to be alone. He takes a sip of his drink and licks his lips. Would it have mattered? I regard the exhaustion in his eyes, his drawn features, and I know how hard he's been trying. Yes, I tell him, it would have. His brow lifts in surprise. My mother thinks we should spend more time getting to know one another. She thinks it will help us move forward. Your mother? I can't hide my shock. I assumed it was your father pushing this marriage. Clayton looks away, and I wonder if I had part of it wrong. I assumed Mrs. Cunningham was on my side, that she might be an ally in all of this. But perhaps she's just as determined about this marriage as the rest of them. I want you to see me beyond my reputation, Joe. To see the man you will marry, not the rumors. Are they only rumors, then? His eyebrows draw together and he shakes his head. No. His cheeks redden with shame but that's not what I want. I don't want him to be ashamed of who he is or feel like he has to change for me. Why are we marrying Clayton? Because even your father seemed surprised at dinner. His frown deepens. No one is forcing me to marry you, he says simply and takes another sip of his drink. It's what I feel is the right thing to do. He sucks his bottom lip between his teeth and stares at the candle flames. Forcing me to marry you is the right thing to do, I bite back, unease needling its way back in. He stares down at the game board and shakes his head. I don't think we'll ever see eye to eye on this topic. No, apparently not. He leans in, resting his arm on the table, and peers at me through heavy eyelids and long lashes. Joe. He whispers my name again, and the way he says it, so earnest and full of conviction, makes my heart race and my insides flutter with butterfly wings. I want you to know me because I want you to know the man I hope you will come to care for someday. Clayton, I say abruptly. The feel of his name on my tongue brings a heat to my breast. Whether it's the sincerity in his voice or the vulnerability in his gaze, 
There is something about him in this room that warms a part of my heart to him even more than before. Are you a good man? I ask wholeheartedly. His brow furrows. A good man? I would like to think I am better than some, but I know I'm not half as good as others, he says artlessly. His gaze is a microscope, and I feel as though I might burst under the heat. I would never hurt you, if that's what you're asking me, he whispers. I've told you that. And just as they did the other day in the train car, his words melt over me, fill me, wrap me in a comfort that dampens every cynical thought and uncertainty. And not for the first time, I imagine what it would feel like to be his wife. This Clayton here, in this room, to have him so close, to feel his gaze on me when he thinks I'm not looking, to feel safe and imagine that he loves me. Our knees touch under the table, and when his eyes are too imploring and his gaze too hot against my skin, I let out a breath and stare down at the game. Let's play our game, shall we? My voice is barely audible above my uneven breaths. I wish to kiss you, he whispers. My hand freezes over the board. He leans closer, his eyes refusing to leave me. May I kiss you, Joe? My head moves up and down of its own accord, but my heart is hammering erratically against my chest. I'm not good at these things. He presses his lips against mine, salty and warm and asking, before I can finish another thought. The warmth and taste of him sends my entire body into tingles, and he brushes the backs of his fingers over my jaw and down my neck. His skin is soft, his mouth skillful as his lips move over mine, slowly, perfectly. The remnants of brandy are sweet on my tongue, and I want to taste more of it. My hand travels up his arm and over his shoulder, feeling the tension coiled and trembling in the muscles I yearn to see beneath his shirt as I pull him even closer. I don't know what's come over me, but I don't care as he kisses me harder and more fervently. The soft pressure of his tongue parts my lips, and heat swirls through me, igniting a hunger deep inside me that I've never felt before, a hunger that enlivens me. Where does the passion come from? the need. I don't recognize the eager woman inside me, bold and unashamed of carnal thoughts, but I want to embrace her. Clayton pulls away from me, licking his lips as he tries to catch his breath. We should not have done that, he says, dousing the fire that burned to blazing inside me only a heartbeat ago. He scrubs his hands over his face. I didn't want to do that like this. Wax and brandy and the sweet tinge of juice lingers in the air between us, and he straightens in his chair. Like what? I rasp, my chest heaving. I pull my hair away from my face and try to catch my breath. Like this, in this house, half drunk. I don't know what to say. My mind is a molten haze of desire and disappointment. You do something to me, Joe. Something that I don't quite understand. Oh? I let out a heavy breath. Sorry? I try not to let my disappointment show, to let him see how much his touch has affected me. He laughs, taking in the sight of me. I amuse him, clearly, and I'm certain I'm more rumpled than before, a panting, trembling mess. But something pleases him, and his eyes brighten. Would it be too forward of me to ask that we do that again sometime soon? He asks, clenching his hands on the table. I dip my chin, licking my lips as hope flits through me. Clayton gestures to the dice. We'd better at least pretend to act decent. I allow myself a quick smile into my wine glass as I take a much-needed gulp. If you insist. I earn a smirk from him and roll the dice. A three and a five. I try not to think about the feel of his tongue against mine as I stare at the dice and calculate my move. He tilts his head, eyeing me carefully as I take my turn. When I can't take his heated gaze a moment longer, I shake my head. It's your turn, I remind him, getting up to pour myself more wine. Clayton chuckles and mutters something about how changeable I am, but I don't take any offense to it. 
whatever this is between us, it's helped me forget about everything else for a little while. We go back and forth until we're nearly tied, but in the end, Clayton wins by a single piece. Not bad for your first game in years. I shrug. I feel as though you had me at an unfair advantage, I tell him. What with all of the distractions and all of your practicing? He chuckles and leans back in his chair. His gaze is hot against my face, and I teeter between leaning in or leaving the room before I have something to regret. Licking my lips, I stand. I should get to bed. I have a feeling we'll be leaving first thing in the morning, and I need my beauty sleep. Clayton nods and motions to his door. I don't want you to go, but I understand. I'll walk you to your room. He takes my hand in his as we reach the door, an unexpected but not unwanted gesture, and he leads me back down the hall to my room. Thank you, he whispers. I face him as we stop outside my door. The masculine scent of him still fills my nose. For? He sighs. For sitting with me, he says. For trusting me. He leans down and presses his lips to mine again, soft and tentative. I know you question my motives, but I want to make you happy, Joe. His voice is a harsh but determined whisper. And while I appreciate his valiant words and I believe that he means them, he's still forcing me to marry him. And save for antagonizing his family and bearing the repercussions, I have no choice in the matter. I pull my hands from his and put a step between us. In an effort to steady my tangled nerves, I nod politely at him. Good night. Chapter 29 Clayton I'm still standing in the drafty hallway moments after Joe closes the door to her room, alone in the darkness. The faint scent of her lingers in my nose, though the memory of her lips against mine already begins to fade. She took a step away from me. Joe's distance douses the heat coursing through my body, the heat that made me feel alive and buoyant for the first time in my entire life. I knew the easiness between us wouldn't last, but I didn't expect to feel so cold so soon after. Our first kiss was not supposed to be this way. I've thought about the touch of her lips against mine many times, how sweet it would be to show her life through a more carnal lens. I thought that if I showed her what was possible between us, she might accept me and the idea of us. But I gave in too soon, and she wasn't ready. My stomach rumbles, and I make my way downstairs to the kitchen. Bread, cheese, I need something to soak up the brandy that coats my insides and clouds my mind. I don't want the memory of our kiss to fade too soon. I'd had two drinks too many by the time I'd found her, standing in the hallway, beautiful with her tousled hair and eyes wide with surprise. The parquet floor is cool beneath my feet as I step into the foyer. The house is dark with only the moonlight filtering in from the skylight. I stop and peer around the entry. How stupid I was to think we could have had a normal dinner. My father coming in, splattered in blood, was nothing short of a nightmare. The sound of clinking glass echoes down the hall, and I forego food for a conversation with my father. I haven't spoken to him since I burst into his study to tell him about Doyle, only to storm out again, unable to even look at him after all he's done. But after tonight, after provoking Mr. Mason when we're supposed to be showing them we can make this work, I can't ignore him any longer. I brace myself for a fight, but hope it doesn't come to that, and I head for his study. Light glows from beneath his study door, and I wrap my fingers on the back of it. Before he can answer, I creak it open and step inside. I expect to find him at his desk or in his chair by the fire but he's not. The large room is lit by a single oil lantern on a table near the fire. My father stands just outside the open French doors, staring out at the inky night. What are you doing awake? I ask. For a moment, the only sound is the hum of the lantern. Thinking, 
he finally says, his voice hoarse from disuse. I hear him slurp from his glass as he takes a drink. I notice a glinting object resting on the desk and take a step closer. I try to focus on it in the dull light and realize it's a glass pendant, a teardrop the size of a large button with a turquoise and purple butterfly frozen against an amber background. There's something familiar about it that makes my heart skip, and I pick it up. The metal of the pendant is cool against my fingertips, and an image of Joe flashes to mind. The awe on her face when she held the butterfly brooch in her hand made me wish to see her smile again, but the hesitation in her voice when she spoke of her love for butterflies echoes. My mother gave me a pendant, a delicate butterfly that was her most cherished possession. Your father tore it from my neck the day she was murdered, and I haven't seen it since. I squeeze the pendant, the clasp digging into the palm of my hand. Where did you get this? I ask, though I'm not sure he can hear me. Dread, hot and chilling, slithers down my spine, and I imagine my father ripping it from around Joe's neck. My blood churns. I picture the tears in her eyes, and my heart breaks as the final thread of hope that my father isn't a complete monster shreds to nothing. Noticing the locked desk drawer has been left open and a red drawstring bag sits in the bottom of it, I snatch it from the drawer before I lose the nerve to see what else he keeps locked away. Soft velvet presses against my fingertips as I loosen the cinch. I hesitate before reaching in to pull out a ruby red lock of hair. Uncertainty gnaws at me as I wonder whose hair I hold between my fingers. It's not mahogany like Joe's, nor crimson enough to be scarlet's. I exhale my relief. The portrait of Caroline with red, jewel-like hair that fell down around her shoulders fills my mind. This is what you're hiding, I hear myself say. Are you sick? The floorboards creak beneath my footsteps, and I stop behind him on the porch. He doesn't even acknowledge my presence. Have you nothing to say? I growl. Why were you covered in blood this evening? Which innocent were you beating on this time? He lets out a mirthless laugh. Another harmless traveler? His head whips to the side, and his mirthless laugh is all but vanished. Yes, I know about that. Though for how long you've been deceiving everyone, I don't care to know. Is there no end to your ruthless? Doyle is no innocent, he says, voice stiff, posture rigid. You killed Doyle? My heart skips a beat. With relief? Abhorrence? He steps closer to the railing. I should have, God help me. That man is more trouble than he's worth. But the men listen to him. Although I know my father has used brute strength with his men in the past to teach them a lesson, I never imagined how far he might actually take it until now. What did he do? He turns to face me. Having his way with your betrothed isn't enough. Whiskey clings to his breath. He's been hiding from me these past two days. I finally found him. I would not let him slip through my fingers again. You beat the shit out of Doyle because of Joe? What, son? You don't approve? I... I shrug. I'm astonished. He sneers. Don't be. My deputies live by a code. He broke it. He knew what was coming. He growls and takes a drink of his whiskey. He's getting too comfortable and needed a reminder of who's in charge. His tone is clipped, and I wonder what he's not telling me. I finger the lock of hair and hold it out to him. Is this what I think it is? I ask him bitterly. His eyes, red-rimmed and heavy, shift between the lock of hair and me. Of course it is. What does it look like? He walks over to the bar to refill his whiskey glass. The bottle topper clanks against the table as he sets it down, and I notice him shaking. He swallows the contents of his glass in two gulps, 
his eyes fixed on me from over the brim. I hold up the necklace. And this? You stole it from Joe? A flash of emotion colors his face, and his eyes narrow on the dangling butterfly pendant. He pulls his bottom lip between his teeth, sucking the whiskey from it as if he needs every last drop. I struggle to remember the last time I saw him sober. Never mind your ruthlessness. I'm beginning to question your sanity. With a curse, he slams his glass down on the table and takes a threatening step toward me. He shoves an incensed finger into my chest. You're clueless. You have no idea what I've sacrificed for this family, he snarls. I lean into him, anger too blinding to care what comes next. What, your humanity? If it's to keep us fed and safe, then yes. That necklace is not Joe's. It's mine. I gave it to Caroline, so I took it back. His shoulders heave, and I take a step back, my gaze slowly lowering to the necklace as it swings, a pendulum in my hand. If Joe knew that, I'm not sure she would want it back, though the nudge in my gut tells me that isn't my decision to make. Stiffening, I stuff the necklace into the pocket of my trousers. You took her mother from her. You don't get this, too. Not unless Joe forsakes it. I step past him and toss Caroline Mason's hair onto his desk before he can try to stop me. It was twelve years ago this week, he says more calmly this time. There's a resolution in his voice that disturbs me, and I stop dead in my tracks. I have done horrible things, but don't think for a moment that I'm not paying for them with every breath. When I peer over my shoulder at my father, he has already stepped soundlessly back out into the night. I wonder if a hell exists more fitting than the one he's already living. Chapter 30, Joe The men are absent from the table when Scarlet and I step into the breakfast room. Though it's much smaller than the dining room, it's still elegant with a coffered ceiling and warm, foliage-patterned wallpaper with golds and browns that disappear beneath the molding. Mrs. Cunningham smiles at us. Good morning, Miss Mason, she says, nodding to me, then my sister. Miss Scarlet? We both bow our heads in greeting. Good morning, we say in unison. Little Isabel grins with a mouthful of food. Good morning, Isabel. You're looking much better this morning. I flash her a genuine smile of relief. She nods happily. I am. Darling, don't talk with your mouth full, please, her mother chides. I nod at Kitty. Good morning, Miss Cunningham. She nods in return, taking a sip from her teacup. Please, sit. Mrs. Cunningham gestures to the two chairs across from Kitty. Isabel swallows thickly. Do you like corned beef? She chirps and takes another bite. Very much. I tell her. Isabel, we get our beef from the Mason's Ranch, Mrs. Cunningham explains. Did you know that? Isabel looks from her mother to Scarlet and me, then she shakes her head. Do you like animals? I ask her, and when she nods without a moment's hesitation, I continue. Perhaps you can come see our sheep and chickens sometime. Yes, please, Mama, can I go with them now? Another time, my sweet girl, Mrs. Cunningham says, placating her. They have to get home soon. Okay, Isabel grumbles. Don't worry, Izzy. Kitty wipes her mouth with her napkin and looks at her little sister. We can go on that scavenger hunt today. Isabel's smile immediately returns and Kitty gazes lovingly back at her. My husband is out of sorts this morning, Mrs. Cunningham starts, and I notice Kitty's easiness disappear. He won't be joining us, and Clayton is seeing to your carriage. I don't tell her that I'm relieved by their absences. After what happened last night with my father and getting very little sleep, sitting in the same room with the marshal seems exhausting. Scarlet pours a cup of tea for herself, then one for me as I put a biscuit on each of our plates. Kitty pours herself more tea as well at the other end of the table. When I catch her looking at me, she actually smiles, not forced this time, but genuine and pleasant. Perhaps helping with Isabel last night has put me in her good graces. 
Regardless of the reason, I'm grateful for it. I'm sure you must be anxious to get home, Mrs. Cunningham continues. I want to apologize again for Marcus last night. She shakes her head as if she's at a loss for words. But when her eyes meet mine, I can see the true remorse in them. For a fleeting moment, I think she knows everything. And after all that you did for Isabel, I'm not sure how I can thank you. I clear my throat and swallow a bite of corned beef. No need to thank me. I'm glad I could help. I eye Isabel. And what are you supposed to do every morning and every night before bed from now on? Breathing exercises, she says with a grin. Though I think she's just happy to know the answer. I'm happy I can make her smile all the same. And what are you to have each night before bed? Her smile falters. Ginger tea. I laugh. Yes, very good. It will help, I promise you. Mrs. Cunningham sips from her cup, reveling in her daughter's innocence. Though, despite Isabel's good color and restful night, Kitty looks sad. Miss Cunningham? I wipe my mouth and smile at Kitty, hopeful. Kitty pauses with her teacup perched at her lips. Last night, well, you mentioned painting, and I noticed a similar piece of art in our guest room. Did you paint the sunflower arrangement as well? Kitty dips her chin slightly and takes a sip of her tea before setting her cup back down. Well, I hope I'm not being too forward, but I was wondering if you might like to show me the basics sometime. I think it's a lost art, and I would love to learn how to paint. Perhaps I can replace some of the moth-eaten portraits in our sitting room with something more decadent, like fruit or flowers. You would have to be patient with me, though, I'm afraid. I prattle on and on, unable to stop myself as I wonder what on earth I am doing. Painting with Kitty, who has clearly disliked me from the start, seems like a miserable way to spend an afternoon. But as the sadness in her eyes lifts, I'm unable to stop myself. Anyway, you can think about it. What a lovely idea, Scarlet chimes in. Would you teach me as well, Miss Cunningham? Scarlet takes my hand in hers beneath the table. Kitty glances between us. Well, if you wish. She looks at Mrs. Cunningham. Wonderful, I say. Your paintings are so lovely, Scarlet adds, and we both take another bite of corned beef. Mrs. Cunningham glances between us and smiles, then takes charge to fill the silence. I trust you both slept well in your room? Scarlet nods, genuinely smiling, and she swallows. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. That feather mattress is a dream. She dabs her mouth with her napkin. I focus on buttering my biscuit as long as the topic lingers on anything having to do with last night, and finish my breakfast, surprisingly ravenous. The china clinks, Isabel rambles about sweet, inconsequential things, and Mrs. Cunningham indulges her. Footsteps echo in the hall, and I hope it's my father who has come to collect us, but Clayton steps into the room. His eyes immediately find mine before he scans the rest of the faces looking at him. Good morning, ladies, he says, and pulls out the chair at the head of the table. Good morning, we mumble with full mouths. Ainsley, coffee, please, he says. The servant, standing against the wall, nods and disappears from the room. Clayton shakes out his napkin and glances up at me. Your father is well this morning, he says, reassuring me. He's still out in the stable, discussing a few things with my steward. You will leave after breakfast. Thank you, Clayton, I say, relieved. Very much. His expression softens and he almost smiles. You're welcome. Silence fills the next few moments, the silver against China echoing more loudly than before. Clayton his mother starts. Perhaps you should ride along with them and make sure they arrive home all right. His gaze shifts from his mother to me, brightened with inquiry. That would be very gracious of you, I admit, but I wouldn't want to impose more than we already have. I pour myself more tea. Ainsley comes back with a teapot of coffee. It seems Mrs. Cunningham's greenhouse produces more than flowers. I inhale the scent of roasted beans and wonder if Mrs. Cunningham's plants didn't first come from somewhere or someone in the Deadlands. Have you ever been to the evening fair, Miss Mason? The big one with the street performers? Clayton asks, and his eyes find mine over the brim of his coffee cup. Not since before my mother died, I say uneasily. Clayton clears his throat. 
What do you think of going with me tomorrow evening? He asks. Mr. Hensley only organizes one every month or so, or so I'm told. I've never paid much attention. To anything, Kitty grumbles, but I don't listen. I can't deny my pull to Clayton, especially not after last night, no matter how much I want to. Clayton sets his cup down, eyebrows furrowed as he waits for me to respond. I, my eyes shift to his lips and I flush, recalling the softness of them against mine in the darkness. This doesn't feel right. None of it does. There's a gnawing guilt in hoping to be happy with him, in seeing a future together. A bit of anger. Um, what a thoughtless request, Clayton says, forcing a smile. I've commandeered enough of your time this past week. I know you have much work to do at the farm. He turns to his mother, disappointment hardening his features. Speaking of which, mother, I meant to tell you, a part of the awning has fallen off, he says more somberly. I noticed it when I was in the stable, probably from the last storm. He doesn't bother to look at me, and I fear he's angry with me, though another part of me doesn't want to care. Good heavens, she says. I was hoping to postpone the metal reinforcements a bit longer until we could get enough scrap metal to take care of the worst parts of downtown, but I'm afraid this house might not make it that long. We can do a little bit at a time, mother. We can make both a priority. Clayton stabs a bite of his corned beef and scrambled eggs. I know you want to keep this place, but we have plenty of bricks. We can always rebuild. It's what will likely save us all in the end anyway. I wasn't aware you were trying to rebuild downtown. I say, grunge alley, to be specific, his mother answers, pride filling her voice as she glances at her son. That's wonderful news. I think of Mrs. Pelly's apartment nearly collapsing around her. Perhaps there's much you don't know, Miss Mason. Clayton stares into his coffee cup as he speaks. His words are colder than I would expect from him. But then I've embarrassed him in front of his family, so I don't blame him. Rebuild might be the wrong word, Mrs. Cunningham says, but there is much work to be done and less and less metal being brought in by the patrols. Any reinforcing projects have been put on hold, for a little while at least. But your house, the farm, is doing well, yes? I wouldn't go so far as to say that, Scarlet mutters. I think it only a matter of time before our patchwork falls to pieces. Why do you not rebuild then, especially if your property is so valuable? Kitty asks. It's not as if you can't afford to. Maybe father can help you rebuild your house, Isabel says, blinking at me and Scarlet. The idea of the marshal touching any part of our home is repugnant to me, and I try not to grimace. I, ah, uh, I clear my throat. I think your father is too busy to worry about our house. But he likes to build things, Isabel chirps. He built my dollhouse for me. He could help you build your house too. Yes, I believe he could, I whisper, gripping the table as my breakfast churns in my stomach. I think Isabel is right. Father would probably make it a priority, Kitty added. He seems to take extra care with your family, and it would be a sound business decision. Feeling heat wash over me, I swallow thickly. If you'll excuse me, my corset suddenly feels too tight, and the walls seem as though they are closing in on me. I fumble to my feet, needing to be out of this house, out of this room filled with innocent, ignorant faces who know nothing of me or my life or what they ask of me by being here. Hurrying through the house, I find an open door to a dark room and step inside. It's a library, and the scent of leather fills the room. The drapes are still drawn, but a sliver of sunlight cuts through the curtains, illuminating the old books and ledgers that line the walls. Photographs and portraits hang between bookshelves, and I spot one of Clayton. His face is rounder, but his eyes are expressive and true to their color, the cool richness I imagine once colored the oceans. I find respite in a leather-backed chair in the corner of the room and lean my head back. My eyes close as I take a deep breath, then exhale a wish. I want to go home. I think your wish might be granted. My eyes open and Clayton steps into the room. His hands are clasped behind his back and he stops a few feet from my chair. He's so tall and his shoulders so broad, 
my heart flutters, and a warmth spreads through me as I realize that, once again, we're in a darkened, quiet room, just the two of us. Would you like me to leave you? His voice is more detached than it ever has been, and I hate that it's because of me. That depends, I breathe. On? For the first time, I wonder what it would feel like to feel his arms wrapped around me, to feel his strength when I feel so weak and lost. On why you've come in here. Not to speak about the marriage, he says as if he's anticipating me, but that's not what I was thinking about at all though the mention of it chases all the warm, fluttering thoughts inside me away. Clayton lowers himself into the chair next to mine. I wanted to make sure you were all right. You don't seem yourself this morning. After last night, I, I hoped things would be different. I'm not supposed to want him. It goes against every fiber in me that's fed on my hatred and distrust over the years. And the fact that I do like him, that I find myself wanting him more and more each day makes me feel sick to my stomach. I'm sorry, I say, springing to my feet. I need distance from him. I've been here too long, around him too much. I've been feeling a bit overwhelmed these past few days. That's understandable, he says, and his compassion makes my chest tighten. I just need some space to think and get out of my head. I begin pacing the room fanning myself as the possibility that I might never overcome this sickening guilt looms above me. I shake my head. I can't live like this. I peer up at the ceiling, as if my mother can hear me. Am I so horrible? There's no jest in Clayton's voice, only disappointment. I turn to him, my skirt swishing in the silence of the room. No, you're not horrible. But this place... My family, the past, I understand. No, I shriek, shaking my head. You don't, you can't, possibly. He nods slowly, thoughtfully. This week marks 12 years since her death, doesn't it? I take a step toward him and my hand flies to my heart. Tomorrow, my thoughts begin to tumble. How did you? My father told me. I swallow. Acid erodes what few tethers still keep me grounded, and I shake my head. You talk to your father? About my mother? He stares at me, dumbfounded. No, not really. But when he told me, it all started making sense. I can't stop my chest from heaving or my mind from spinning. That tortured look in your eyes, he says, walking over to me. Everything that's happening, the anniversary, with everything going on, she's not here for you. Clayton reaches for me, and the clawing need to scream grips me and I step away. His eyes become frantic. I want to help you, he says gravely and shoves his hand into his pocket. I have something for- You what? I ask, breathless. Clayton's hand freezes in his pocket. I want to help you, he repeats. The gut-wrenching sickness I feel in my stomach, the guilt that consumes me when you're around, that's your doing. I shake my head as hysteria creeps its way in. Yet you sit here, offering me your condolences and saying you wish to help me? I clench the fabric of my dress as my hands begin to tremble. His brow lowers. I do want to help. Well, I don't want your help, I bite out. What I want is to stop hating myself for forgetting who you are and wanting to be with you when everything your family represents is death and misery and fear. How can you help me with that, Clayton? His eyes flash with blue fire as he steps closer. Last night meant something to you. I know we can. Of course it did, and yet I hate myself for it today. But it won't always be that way, Joe. It's going to take time. How can you not see that? There's a shit storm to wade through, I know that. But why can't we do it together? Why do you have to do it alone? Because, Clayton, every single time I see you, I think of him, I say my anger dwindling as tears fill my eyes. Every time I start to forget the hatred I've held onto for the past 12 years, it makes me sick. This, our families, together, it will never work. You saw what it did to my father last night. He stares down at the floor, his jaw ticking as his chest heaves. Every time I imagine my life with you, 
I squeak out more softly. I feel like I'm betraying myself and everything I've held on to my entire life. Being here, in this house, it's all a reminder of the past. I hate my mother for what she did, but I hate myself for forgetting that you're a Cunningham and that your family ruined my life. I will never be whole again. It will never feel right. My chest heaves as I suck in a deep breath. As wrong as every word feels, each one is a weight lifted off my heart, and I feel so light it's as if I might fall. Sweetheart. I turn to the doorway. My father and Mrs. Cunningham stand there. My father's eyes shift between Clayton and me. The carriage is ready. He hesitates, then turns and leaves Mrs. Cunningham standing in the doorway. Her eyes are downcast, and I know they've heard every word I've said. She stands there a moment, worrying the handkerchief in her hand as she eyes her son. Then she walks away. I'm sorry, I tell him, wiping the tears from my cheeks. Clayton continues to stare down at the floor, one hand on his hip as the other rakes through and grabs hold of his hair. You should go. I'm sorry, I don't want to hurt you. I search for the words, I want to explain. I know you can't control the past, it's just, I just can't let go, not yet. He nods. On shaking legs, I head for the door, tears catching in my throat as I contemplate the hurt in his eyes and my heart that aches for him and my father and a life I want, but I'm not sure I can ever have. Miss Mason, Clayton says loudly. I stop in the doorway, struck by his formality and tone. When I peer back at him, he stands as I left him, still staring down at the floor. I'm sorry for the pain I've caused you. I release you from the engagement. I should have never forced it on you to begin with. A desperate sob escapes my throat as I hurry out of the house. I don't know if I'm grateful to him or mourning what I might have lost. Chapter 31 Joe, everything will be fine, I whisper to Scarlet as we step into the bookstore. He may not even be here. Dottie glances up from the customer she's helping. Good afternoon, Miss Mason, Miss Scarlet. Miss Trainer regards us over her shoulder and waves her new book purchase at us. Oh, Miss Scarlet. She twirls around in her striped skirt to wrap her arms around my sister as we step up to the counter. How is my new dress coming along? After a quick kiss on the cheek, Miss Trainer pulls away and looks slyly at her. I can barely stand the suspense. Scarlet's face brightens in return. It's nearly completed, just a few more finishing touches. It will be ready for your night out with Mr. Simpson's son, I assure you. Scarlet takes the fabric of Miss Trainer's patchwork skirt between her fingers. The patterns and colors mismatched, like a faded stained glass. I miss skirts like these she says admiringly. This old thing? Maddie made it for me years ago, before the Marshall's men started finding all of those pretty fabrics and I forgot about it. I leave the girls to their chatter and turn to Dottie. To what do I owe the pleasure today, Miss Mason? You're staying out of trouble, I hope? I force a laugh and shake my head. No trouble for me, Miss Reinhurst. I peer down the hallway to see if there's any movement, then up at the ceiling, at the floor above. My sister is here to meet Toby, I whisper. Dottie's brow furrows, a protective gesture that I admire. It's not public knowledge, I start. Not yet, but my sister and Mr. Ashford are to be married. It would mean a lot to her to meet the boy. Dottie's expression is somewhere between surprise and concern. She knows then, does she? How could I keep it from her? I have noticed that he speaks fondly of her, Dottie admits though I had no idea I was so serious. Yes, it's very serious. Goodbye, Scarlet chirps as Miss Trainer takes her parcel, waves farewell, and pulls the door shut with a rattle behind her. Scarlet turns to face us, her expression sobering. Good afternoon, Ms. Reinhurst, she says politely. Has Joe told you why we've come? Dottie nods and comes around the counter, wringing her hands as she motions to the chairs against the wall. Tobias should be back any moment. He's gone to fetch us our daily ration of water. Perfect, Scarlet says, though her easiness wavers and she peers around the room. 
everything will be fine, I repeat for the dozenth time and plop down beside her. He's taking care of Mrs. Pelly quite splendidly for you too. Scarlet smiles at that. I can't say I'm surprised, not if he's got Jonathan in him. And does Jonathan know that you've come here to meet the boy? Scarlet looks at Dottie and shakes her head. He's told me about Tobias, though he's been too nervous to introduce us. I figured an invitation for the boy to attend dinner with us was just the thing. Scarlet talks of what plans she's already made for the wedding, but my thoughts drift as I watch people pass by the window, going about their daily business, carrying their water pails, some of them even wearing their goggles around their neck out of habit. A man with tawny hair strolls by, and despite myself, I think of Clayton. I've kept myself so busy so that I won't think about him, yet he's all that occupies my thoughts when I stop to breathe. I don't know what he's doing on this warm afternoon, but I can't help but wonder. Coming to town was a decision not easily made, knowing he might stumble out of the brothel or walk through town with his father at any moment. I still feel horrible about what I said to him, even if it was the truth at the time. However, space and time have a way of blurring what I remember and how I feel, and I wonder if it was all really as bad as I thought. After all, he gave me what I wanted, but now I think of him more than ever. A blonde woman hurries past the shop window, walking faster than the rest of the passers-by. She's skittish and holds herself as if she might blow away in the breeze. Is that the beekeeper's daughter? I ask, and before the woman hurries out of view, I notice her blackened eye. I turn to Dottie, who seems to know everything about everyone in this town. What on earth's happened to her? Dottie sighs and sets a stack of books down on the counter with a clack. You'll only need one guess, Miss Mason. The way her eyes shift to my lip, though it's long healed, I know immediately. Doyle, she nods, or perhaps one of his men. It's hard to tell anymore. Dottie tosses her braid behind her shoulders and begins to sort the tomes out by their covers. The front door flies open and bangs against the bookcase. You could have left the door open for me, Toby grumbles. This thing ain't light, you know. I sneak a peek at Scarlet, her eyes locked on Toby as he makes his way to the counter. She fidgets, she swallows. I smile at how endearingly nervous she is. When he notices my sister and me sitting in the chairs, he nods to me. Miss Mason, you come to check on me? Make sure I haven't run off with your money? I can't help but snort a laugh. No, I trust you, Toby. You take such good care of Ms. Reinhurst. I know you do the same for Mrs. Pelly. He regards me and then my sister carefully as he shuffles down the hall, lugging a large bucket of water. It's not plentiful by any means, but it's bigger than it was before. And I feel a sense of ease as I realize I've done at least one thing right this past month. Not a single drop splashes over the rim as Toby disappears into the kitchen. Scarlet studies him, taking him in as she collects herself, and I wonder what she's thinking. He chooses not to bathe. I explain, he's not here to be cared for. He's here to care for Ms. Reinhurst. I repeat his words with affection. Scarlet loves him already. She shakes her head and grips her chest with a love-struck smile. I chuckle softly, imagining Dottie trying to get him clean only to decide it's not worth the exasperation. When Toby walks back down the hallway, his hand in his pocket and his hat on sideways, he glances between us. Perhaps we should offer our guests something to drink, Dottie says. Toby shrugs. You want some sweet tea or something? Scarlet and I are quick to say, no thank you, and Toby's eyes level on me. The marshal, he prompts. You said you know him. Dottie's getting old. She could use some more water. Tobias, she scolds, batting his shoulder. It's never polite to talk about a woman's age, nor is it a good idea to insult her especially if she's the one who feeds you. Even as Dottie chides him, he doesn't lift his gaze from me, and I can tell he's worried about her. It does him credit. I don't think asking for a favor would be wise, I tell Toby, but I promise you that I will always make sure Ms. Reinhurst has plenty of water, you and her both. She and Mr. Cunningham have broken off their engagement, my sister whispers by way of explanation. Dottie's eyes widen a little. 
A wisp of hair falls from my chignon and I blow it out of my face. Thank you for that, Scarlet. I exhale, long and loud, realizing it's very unbecoming, but I'm not sure I care. But she's right. Mr. Cunningham and I are not on very good terms at the moment. We haven't been for nearly two weeks now. Toby shrugs, not giving two twigs about my relationship status, and is about to leave when I realize he's the whole reason we've come. How rude of me, Toby, I say, standing. He looks at me quizzically. I wanted to introduce you to my sister, Scarlet. She's a friend of your father's. Toby is momentarily surprised, but his frown softens, as all men's do, when he looks at Scarlet. She stands and offers him a slight curtsy. Nice to meet you, Toby. He nods and eyes her up and down. I've seen you round town. I think my pa's mentioned you a time or two. Scarlet flushes. You speak to him often, do you? Toby shakes his head and picks at a scab on the back of his dirty hand. When he can manage it. Well, Scarlet says, your father and I are very good friends. So what do you say to joining us for dinner this evening? Toby frowns. Why would I go to dinner with you? Dottie nudges his shoulder and grumbles something inaudible to him. Joe will be there, and your father. Scarlet looks at me, uncertain. I nudge her for encouragement. And it would be a good way for us to get to know you better. I know your father misses you. Wouldn't you like to see him? Toby considers her a moment, assessing this new woman who's so open and kind. Scarlet looks worried, so I help the process along. It's up to you, of course, I tell him. I know you have a strict rule against accepting charity, but that's not what this is. We'll have extra food. Even if I did try to tell Scarlet you wouldn't want a hot meal, stew and mashed potatoes, you probably don't like stuff like that. Dottie smiles, if only a little and to herself, and Toby licks his lips. You probably don't like animals either, Scarlet adds, catching on. She looks at me and shakes her head. Kip would be all over him, and Toby would hate it. Who's Kip? Kip is our dog, Scarlet says. We have lots of animals. Too many, if you ask me. Kip's a mangy thing. He licks a lot and wags his tail too much, I explain. He's a pesky creature, really. Toby shifts from one foot to the other and crosses his arms over his chest as if this is the most difficult yet enticing proposition he's ever heard. What kind of stew you havin'? He finally asks, his chin lifted as if he's received a better offer somewhere else. I laugh and shake my head, reaching for Scarlet's basket. Come on, Scarlet, I told you he wouldn't be interested. Well, he says, glancing up at Dottie, and for the first time I realize part of his hesitation. There would be plenty to bring home for later, I tell him. You could save it for another day or share it with Dottie. As if those were the magic words, Toby nods. I better get washed up if I'm going to go with you, he says, staring at his dirty hands. You wash for them, but not for me, huh? Dottie shakes her head and swats him playfully in the direction of the wash closet. Get behind your ears, she calls to him. Why don't you come join us, Ms. Reinhurst? Scarlet says, reading my mind as always. We'll have plenty of food and we would love to have you. You do so much for the boy and... Dottie shakes her head. Thank you, Miss Scarlet, but I will be fine here. It will be good for Tobias to spend some time with your family and his father. Besides, some alone time is precisely what I need. Dottie, Toby calls, I can't see behind my ears. Scarlet holds up her hand with a contagious, happy laugh. I'll help him. When Scarlet disappears down the hall, Dottie steps closer to me. I can tell she's concerned, and unlike in the past, she doesn't beat around the bush. Are you okay with this marriage business of your sister's, Miss Mason? I lean against the counter, smiling to myself. Yes, I love how easily the word comes out and how true it is. My father has always trusted Mr. Ashford, at least as much as he could, and now I understand why. It's high time that I do too. I've seen the way he looks at my sister, and he knows this town better than most. She's safe with him. She will be happy, and hopefully Toby will too. Dottie looks at me, really looks into my eyes and searches for something, though I know not what. I am very proud of you, Miss Mason. She waves her words away. 
I know I'm just an old shop owner, but I've seen a lot and, well, I'm proud to know you, that's all. I think your mother would be proud of you too. I felt so lost these past few weeks, her words nearly bring tears to my eyes. Thank you, Dottie, I say, but I don't know that she would. I feel as though I've had more regrets in this past month than I have in all my life combined. I'm sorry that you and Mr. Cunningham could not find common ground, she says. He's a troubled boy, I'll give you that, but he's not cold-hearted, not like his father has always been. Although I hate the marshal, even now I question his cold heart, at least where his daughter is concerned. The heat is humid today, strangely so and I fan myself with one of the stacked books. I don't care to talk about any of them, if it's all the same to you, Ms. Reinhurst. Thinking too much gets me into trouble. Dottie nods, though there is something guarded in her expression. She shifts her focus to the books on the counter, looking at the bindings before she places them in their appropriate stack. What is it? I ask her. Why were you looking at me funny? She smiles. Ainsley was in here yesterday. He mentioned you tried to befriend Miss Cunningham. My lips purse as I try to understand. What do you mean? Something about painting? I don't know. She brushes the explanation away. I should have liked to see her face, though. She is always so bitter and angry. But then again, perhaps that's what happens with loneliness. She's always been the outsider. What do you mean? Dottie presses one stack of books against her chest and walks over to one of the bookshelves. Well, she starts, she has no mother, a father who neglects her, and a brother with questionable lineage who will receive everything when the marshal dies, leaving her with nothing. Isabel is the only thing that connects them all. A saving grace for her, I think. Dottie studies one of the book covers, then slides the volume into the shelf next to its partner. A perfect fit, she mutters. She moves down to another row, oblivious to my confusion. I follow her, leaning against the shelf as she peruses it. I don't understand. She has no mother? Is Kitty adopted? Dottie looks at me funny, then bends down and slides another book in. Scarlett and Toby laugh down the hall, but I tune them out. Kitty does seem a bit out of place in her family, though I figured it was out of jealousy. Dottie straightens, her hand holding her lower back as she winces. No, miss. Clayton is adopted, well, by the marshal, at least. Kitty's mother died during childbirth, leaving the marshal a widower and without an heir. When Mrs. Cunningham's husband died a year or two after Clayton was born, the marshal took her and the child in. What? My mind begins to spin as it always seems to do when it comes to Clayton Cunningham. Does he know? Dottie lifts a shoulder, finally registering my utter surprise. This isn't a secret, miss. I, I didn't realize. It happened so long ago, I'm not sure anyone thinks about it much. I guess that's one of the perks of being an old lady. You've been around for a while and know a little bit about everything. Kitty's mother is the one the marshal was forced to marry. The one his father chose over my mother, I realize. And Clayton, what happened to his father? What happened to whose father? Scarlet asks. What's wrong, Joe? Your cheeks are rosy. That's because I feel so foolish, I say. Everything's starting to make a bit more sense. Clayton is not the marshal's real son. They say the marshal killed Clay's dad so he would have a son. I glance down at Toby, wearing fresh clothes and a face, arms, and probably ears that are scrubbed clean as a whistle. Tobias, those are rumors, Dottie warns. Don't go spreading lies like the rest of them. He shrugs and makes his way for the door. We'll make sure he gets home safe tonight, Scarlet says and follows Toby to the door. Come, let's grab a few things at the grocer's to take home for dinner. I follow absently, my mind fuzzy with too many thoughts, and I'm suddenly anxious for Clayton. Forgive my forwardness, Miss Mason, but... Dottie rests her hand on my arm. I pause in the doorway. Yes? Well, I'm here, miss, if you need to talk. Thank you, Dottie. That's very comforting. Perhaps when I get my thoughts sorted out, I can bring over some lunch. She nods, hesitates, then finally says, and I think your mother would want you to be happy. 
no matter what. She nods to herself, as if she's certain. Realizing Dottie's the closest thing I have to a friend and a mother, I lean in and kiss her cheek. Thank you, I whisper, this time more earnestly. The heat of the day beats on the back of my dress as we stand in the doorway, and her silky skin is soft against my cheek. How have you been feeling? I ask, though it seems like a lifetime ago since she'd fallen ill. She blinks slowly, and a small, grateful smile parts her lips as she straightens. Good as new, thanks to you. Good, and thank you for the bit about the marshal, I say, still surprised and embarrassed I hadn't known he'd adopted Clayton or killed his father. I'm not sure if my time away from town these past years has been more hurtful than good. We'll bring Toby home before it gets too late. Dottie nods, and as I pull the door shut behind me, I'm greeted by a red-faced Doyle and one of his slimy men, both sets of eyes fixed on me. His stare is a sharp, scheming one, and with a lecherous smile, he begins to whistle and continues walking down the sidewalk. I'm beginning to wonder if he's not worse than the horrible Marshal Cunningham himself. Chapter 32, Joe. Look at that one, over there, to the right. I point up into the stars, shimmering against the clear darkness. Scarlet peers through the telescope, her mouth falling open. Oh, I see it. Do you think it's a planet, or perhaps a meteor? It could be an extraterrestrial. I smile. Not possible, Scarlet says. No being in their right mind would want to come to this desolate place. She snickers and tosses a few sunflower seeds into her mouth. It's nice to be outdoors after being shut inside for the past two days during the sandstorm. We stare up at the twinkling stars, and the vastness of space leaves me feeling small and more curious than ever. I watch the North Star blink, then a few others surrounding it but a twinkling one catches my eyes as it starts to move. What's that? I ask, peering through the telescope. What's what? Whatever it is, it's moving. I finally find it through the lens, and though it's closer, it's still too small and dark to make out. A shooting star? Scarlet asks, but it's moving too slowly for that. It appears to be floating. What, like a balloon? Scarlet laughs and nudges me aside. Let me see, she says and I step out of the way. I think it is a balloon. That's not possible, Joe, don't be silly. Says who, I ask, the marshal? Hmm, Scarlet straightens and peers up at the sky, pursing her lips. No, says history. Where did it go? I search the stars for it again, some of them stagnant, some of them blinking, but none of them floating or moving. It's gone, I say regretfully. I squint one eye, peering through the lens again, but finding nothing. I imagine how different everything could possibly be. A different world that lies to the north, up in the mountains that we're told are too treacherous and desolate for even the deputies to explore, where people wear fur cloaks to keep themselves warm. Scarlet and I stare up at the sky, though my sister's thoughts are likely less daring than mine. It's been three days in a row that Toby's come to dinner, the sandstorm playing a large part in that. But it's also been three days that Mr. Ashford has stayed to dine with us as well. I know it's only a matter of time before Scarlet will be gone and I will be left to my own devices again, tending the farm with father. Tinkering, thinking, wondering. Do you know what I think? I ask Scarlet and sit up on the creaky railing. A lot of things she says, and leans against me. We both stare up at the vastness surrounding us, the screech of owls and cricket songs punctuating the silence. I think I should like to leave this place. Scarlet laughs. Oh, really? And where will you go? There's a reason drifters flock here. There is nothing out there, nothing worth living for, at least. Otherwise, we would have left a long time ago. It used to be their land. Though I know it's true. Our history offers a watered-down version of it, but I don't say that. No one ever does. We're supposed to hate them, but... I think it's a lie, I tell her. I think that there is a whole other world, many perhaps, and I want to know them. Scarlet finally looks at me, her eyes black in the darkness. Careful, sister, 
I'm starting to think you are serious. That's because I am. She turns to face me fully, her hip resting against the railing, her arms crossed over her chest as she tightens her shawl around her. Is this my punishment for marrying Jonathan? Oh, stop it. I shove her shoulder and shake my head. I'm serious. She clasps my hand. You would never consider that if I were staying at the ranch. You can, you know. She looks sheepish a moment and nods. I know, but I'm not like you and father. I can't lose myself to this place for days on end. I like town. I want to be close to the shops and my customers. For a little while, at least. When Papa, well, when Papa passes, we could come back. I know Jonathan likes the farm. I rub her arm and kiss her cheek. I know you want a break from this place, Scarlet. I don't blame you. I'm only reminding you that you'll always have a place here. I can already picture you settled into your townhouse with your husband and adopted child. I don't have to worry about you anymore, I say easily. You'll have your husband for that. And you? If you leave, who will protect you? Where will you go? The disquiet in her voice echoes my own. I don't know, I admit. I guess I'll have to learn to protect myself. I peer up at the stars, wishing I might be suspended up there with them away from everything that's complicated in the darkness down here. But I feel that if I stay here, I will lose my mind. Scarlet leans her head against my shoulder and shushes me. No, 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 Joe, I'll still need you. I am happy to marry Jonathan, but I'm nervous too. I don't know how to be a wife or a mother. Her fretful tone gives me pause. What would I do if you left? Who would I talk to? The desire to leave dissipates as I imagine Scarlet bearing a child I would never see. All right, you've convinced me, I tell her. My adventure can wait. I would never leave you anyway, Scarlet. Not to mention there would be no one left to look after father. I reach for the blanket on the rocking chair behind me and wrap it around us. It's been nice, hasn't it, Joe, having Toby here the past couple days? I nod. Very much. I think father enjoys his presence most of all. Scarlet laughs softly. Papa's always said he'd never regret not having a son because he has you, she jests. But I can imagine what it would have been like for him to have a Toby. Me too. I'm sure Toby's soaking up all the attention. And, I say, elbowing her, I think you want him over with your honey corn cakes. Scarlet lets out a lazy sigh. They are quite delicious. Have you decided on a wedding date? I know you want it to be small and only a few of us, but I need to speak with my dressmaker about a dress. Scarlet elbows me. Oh, she'll make you the perfect dress. She stares up at the stars for a few moments. Then I feel her move and she turns to face me. I was considering having the wedding on Mama's birthday next month. What do you think? Though I'm surprised, I remind myself that Scarlet doesn't know what I do about our mother and the marshal. And like father, I want to keep it that way. I rest my head on her shoulder, shut my eyes, and inhale the faint scent of dried heather floating in the air. It would be nice to have something to celebrate in September, instead of something we all commiserate, I tell her, feeling an unexpected lightness. We gaze into the endless sky, the stars speckling it as far as the eye can see, and I wish I knew how far it reached. Joe? Scarlet whispers, hmm? I know this is a girl's night and we're supposed to be having fun, but what did you decide to do about Clayton? Will you tell him what you learned? About his real father? She nods and brushes a wayward strand of hair from my face. Well, I start, having wondered the same question over and over myself. He already knows about his lineage. He's alluded to it a few times in regard to his sister. And I don't think it's my place to tell him about the rumors, if he hasn't heard them already. I tuck my hair behind my ear. But you and I both know what the marshal is capable of. What if they're not rumors? The last thing I told Clayton was that he and his family ruined my life. I can't very well keep inserting myself in his, risking the same, no matter how much I might want to help him. Especially if it's just speculation. Like he thought he was helping you. She muses quietly. Yes. Not to mention you would be pitting yourself against the marshal again, and we're still awaiting the repercussions from you both breaking the engagement. 
I heave out a sigh that seems to carry every wistful thought I've had of Clayton in the past week or so. I'm not worried about that, I say for the first time aloud. I know Clayton would never let his father punish me for it, especially when he called it off himself. Knowing he did, though, makes me miss him more. Shutting my eyes, I let the cool breeze of the night caress my skin. If I didn't know better, Scarlet whispers, one might think you miss your Clayton. Her teasing puts a sad smile on my face. As if you didn't already know that. That is the reason you suggested having us time, is it not? To get my mind off things? She chuckles and walks over to the telescope to dismantle it. Not very subtle, huh? As subtle as a bag of rocks dropped into a stream. Scarlet shrugs. Actually, speaking of the stream, I still haven't seen it. Will you take me tomorrow? If you wish. I remove the scope from its tripod. Though you'll have to get dirty, and I know how you feel about. Scarlet punches my arm and points north. Did you see that, Joe? A shooting star. Bony knuckles, I grunt, peering up at the sky. I smile as the tail end of it fades to nothing. We should make a wish. The sound of hurried horse hooves fill the calm night, and Scarlet and I glance at one another with unease. Someone's coming this late? Scarlet muses. Father, I call as we walk to the road, quickly filling with alarm. Mr. Ashford's horse rides into view. Why's he come at such an hour? Scarlet murmurs, and both of us stiffen. Something's wrong, I say, as I realize Mr. Ashford is not the one atop his horse. The gray's head jerks and flails and fights against the rider. Toby! Scarlet shouts, running toward the road. What on earth? We rush over to him, Scarlet reaching for the horse's reins as I help the crying boy climb down. What's happened? Scarlet bleats beside me. Where's Jonathan? I reach for Scarlet's hand and squeeze it to calm her. Toby, I say calmly, and I slowly pull his trembling body into me. He shivers and shakes, and he stares right through me as Scarlet shouts for our father. I was supposed to protect her, he wails, and my heart stops when I see the red on his clothes. Toby, I breathe, whose blood is that? Chapter 33 Clayton. What are you doing in here so late? My father walks into the kitchen, voice gruff, as if, like me, he's been alone and awake for hours. It's nearly morning. I peer up from the ledgers at the candles that are burned so low one of the wicks is nearly down to the holder, before I dip my quill in an almost dry inkwell. Trying to figure out how many of your men are stealing from you, I stare back down at the numbers that date five years back. And for how long? But working in near dark in the kitchen? I was hungry, I grumble and peer up at the wall clock. Four hours ago, it would seem. My father stops beside me and peers down at the papers strewn about, absent of any plates or discarded food. Hmm. He steps over to the bread box and pulls out a quarter loaf of Smitty's famous French bread. What's hmm? He ignores me and steps into the cool pantry and opens the cellar door. When he comes back, it's with a wedge of cheese and a stick of butter. You're going to kill yourself if you keep eating like that, I tell him. A strange expression crumples his face, but he doesn't look at me. So you're talking to me again? he muses, and a broad, unexpected smile lights his face. I guarantee you, son, something else will kill me before this does. He cuts off a piece of cheese and plops it in his mouth. Happy thoughts, I mutter. He disappears into the pantry again and returns with a pitcher of milk, pours a little into a glass, and takes a sip. White cream colors his mustache, and I watch him, thoroughly amused. There's a sight I haven't seen in ten years. He spreads a bit of butter onto a chunk of bread. That's because you're generally stumbling through the door drunk right about now, or passed out in one of Hannah's rooms. I sicken at the picture he paints. Ah, the prodigal son. Yet, my father says, handing me the piece of bread with butter spread over the top. 
here you are, working. My stomach grumbles with hunger pangs, so I accept the bread and tear off a piece to pop into my mouth. It's better than I expected, and the butter coats my throat. Why are you still up? I ask him. I'm not as surprised to see him awake as I am shocked that he seems to be sober. Restless, I guess. He hands me a piece of cheese. I realize that both the cheese and the milk likely came from the Mason's ranch. How much of the town's food supply do the Masons produce? I ask. There are many things I never cared much about until now. Nearly half the produce, given their water supply. A quarter of the meat and a little more than half of the dairy, which is sourced out to the trainers for processing and a few others. He takes a break from cutting a piece of cheese and looks at me. Why the sudden curiosity? I ignore his question. That's a lot. I never considered how much that farm produces. He bites off another piece of bread and leans against the counter. I told you they were important. We provide the men for the grunt work and labor, but Charles is the mastermind behind most of it. He and Ashford tell them when to plant and pick and pull and how to do it correctly. Reservation tightens my father's voice, and although he says nothing about it, I can tell he has not and will likely never forgive Mason for marrying Caroline. He can till this land better than anyone. That's why we need him, he explains. Yes, well, as I mentioned before, you'll have to find another way to secure him if you're still worried about it. I scrape a drip of wax from the tabletop. So you said. And you're taking it very well. I'm still not sure if he's testing me, or if he's really going to let the fact that I ended it go. Licking his lips, my father wipes the crumbs from his mustache. As I've told you before, Clay, I'm not worried about Charles. He's been compliant with our agreement for years. I'm worried about his daughter. Yes, well, there's nothing I can do to help you with that, so I'd like to drop the topic, please. I flip through the pages of the ledger, exhaustion finally setting in. I already know who's stealing from me, he says, and moves his food tray to the table. He pulls out a chair and sits beside me. I drop my quill. What? He leans back, arms crossed over his loose linen shirt. Doyle and his men have been skimming a little from the top of all their findings for the past three years. At least, it started out as a little. His men? You mean your men? He shrugs. And you've done nothing to stop them? I glower at him. That's surprising. Though my father makes no reply, worry lines crinkle the corners of his eyes. You make them happy, and they do what you tell them to do. That's the way things work around here. At least, they used to. What are you not telling me? I can see it in his face and hear the weight and concern of whatever it is in his voice. What is it, aside from what's happened with the Masons, that's been bothering you? He lifts an eyebrow and reaches for a chunk of cheese. His hands are large and calloused, those of a working man so different than mine. He offers me a piece which I accept, then cuts one for himself. Your mother says you're not eating. I hold up the half-eaten chunk of cheddar. I'm eating. Now tell me, what is going on with you? He eyes me carefully and considers something that seems to amuse him before he finally speaks. What do you know of your grandfather? He asks. I lift an eyebrow. The past is all that matters in this place. What my father did shaped me, and what I've done will shape you. So, what do you know of him? I rest my elbow on the table and watch him carefully, measuring his expression before I answer. He was a bastard of sorts. I know you were forced to marry your first wife before you met mother and you took us in. She painted you as a knight in shining armor who had come to rescue us when we needed you most. The corner of his mouth lifts. I'm not sure about that part of it, he says. But our agreement was mutually beneficial. She needed protection. I needed an heir. And what of Kitty? 
I'm not sure she'll ever forgive me for being born. Kitty would never be Marshall here, even if your mother had never married me, he says with a long sigh. Your sister doesn't have the constitution for it, and she's a woman. The men around here, the deputies at least, they have little respect for women. He stabs a piece of cheese with his knife. I have failed your sister. Blamed her most of her life for things out of her control. Ignored her. You blame her for her mother's death? He stares at the wall, as if a portrait of a woman I've never seen hangs there. Sadie was a good woman, but only a means to an end. As you know, it was an arranged marriage, one neither of us wanted. Because you loved Caroline, I realize. He eyes me and a storm of dark emotions cloud his eyes. Being a cunning ham means sacrifice. I know you think me a cruel man, which is what I have become. But it's not without a price. What I've done, he starts gazing through me. I have not forgotten, nor will I ever. Darkness is alive in this town, lurking and waiting. I've just tried to contain everything the best I can. With secrets and more lies, I add. He nods, among other things. The house settles eerily around us. This place is crumbling, Clayton. You'll have to figure out a way to change the path we're on. His eyes glaze over and he rubs his bearded chin on his shoulder. You'll have to be a better marshal than me. His words send a slight sense of panic rippling through me, as if the day is so close to approaching I can feel it breathing down my neck. We can figure it out together, I tell him. He stares at me, unblinking. What? I ask, feeling a sickening sense of dread. I know you have abandoned the marriage to Miss Mason. At her request. But I hope that you can help persuade her otherwise. I lean back and shake my head. There's nothing I can do. Me, us, you, this house. It's too much for her. She thinks we've ruined her life, and now I think she wants to ruin you. At least, she used to want to. I don't pretend to know her thoughts now. My father laughs, boisterous and clearly amused. <laughs> if she only knew. She is so much like her mother. Whatever connection my father has to that family makes my stomach turn, and even now I grasp for understanding. Why do you want her so close? I won't let you hurt her, any of them. He studies me, his eyes narrowing as his gaze shifts over my face, but we sit in silence. A creak from somewhere upstairs fills the kitchen. I told you I wanted you to marry her for her own protection, he reminds me. I meant it. I am not a danger to the Masons or Josephine, nor will I ever be again. You have my word on that. But it's more than that. You'll need her by your side. She's your match. Father, protection from who? Doyle, some of your men? You're the one she fears. And why put on this show and act as though you're heartless and cruel if you have no intentions of being so? You'll learn, Clayton, that you will only have one true weapon in this place if you want to survive. You must decide early on what that weapon will be. Fear, it would seem, is mine. And I've found that it's best to embrace the monster and use it to your advantage or risk losing it all. To satisfy your men? He tilts his head and measures me a moment. For my men, for the people. Fear is a great weapon, one my father passed down to me years ago. I've been doing a lot of reflecting these past months, and I've come to terms with the darkness in me. But that's something you'll never have, and I wonder if your real father's death wasn't somehow meant to be. Your new blood. Better blood. You've got your mother's goodness despite your folly. His words are leaden with something I don't understand. Something looming. I won't be around much longer. And while my power was based on fear, you need to decide what your 
What do you mean you won't be around much longer? He blinks, settling his gaze on me instead of nothingness, and without saying a word, I somehow see it. His distance from us, his long nights and disappearances during the days, his drinking and regrets all piling so high, he can't seem to escape them anymore. I swallow, the truth thick and cloying in my throat. You're sick? With a restlessness in his eyes, he stands up and clears the table. I believe you were right the other night. I sold my soul for this place, and the devil has come to collect, it would seem. He rubs his chest, an absent gesture I've noticed once or twice. This place will be yours soon, Clayton. Sooner than I anticipated, and the men have never been so divided. They do what I say out of fear, and some out of loyalty. But Doyle whispers in their ears, tempting them, blinding them. He shakes his head, chuckling to himself. I should have killed him the other night, but it would seem I've chosen a funny time in my life to question right and wrong. His words wash over me in a numbing cold. Father, how come you... He leans forward and taps the ledgers. Not only do you now know every grain house, cellar, and some of what they bring back, you know who not to trust. Ashford will help you with whatever you need. He smiles sadly and writes himself again. I think that's enough heart to heart for this old man tonight. He leaves his food out for the servants to clean when they wake in an hour or so. I stand, unable to stifle my panic. But how long have you known you're sick? When? A muffled thumping fills the foyer and makes its way into the kitchen. We stare into the darkened hallway, and when the pounding continues, I grab a candlestick and follow my father into the entry. Shouting loudens as we rush to the front door. Marshal! Is that Ashford? I ask as my father flings the front door open. Ashford stands on the porch, gasping for air, and covered in blood. What is it? My father tugs his deputy inside and into a chair. What's happened to you? I hear my mother murmuring upstairs and the opening and closing of doors as the servants stir. Ainsley, my father calls. Fetch the doctor. It's not my blood, Ashford gasps, his chest heaving. It's Miss Reinhurst's. She's dead. Coldness fills me, and I feel the blood drain from my face. Who did this, Jonathan? I meet his wild eyes. Why would someone hurt an innocent elderly woman? It was Doyle, Ashford spits. My father glances at me, though he doesn't seem surprised. Tobias, Ashford heaves. He said he was walking back to the bookstore and stumbled across Doyle and a couple of his men, drunk and angry. Ashford looks pointedly at my father. Doyle knew who he was, that Tobias is my son, he says. Utterly confused, I look to my father. Son? Ashford rests his hands on his thighs as he collects himself. They followed him to the bookstore. The fear and anger in his voice are palpable. I'd only left for a moment to go to the grocer for them. His eyes squeeze closed as he shakes his head. When I returned, they'd just left, and Dottie, she died in my arms. His eyes glisten, and his nostrils flare as he tries to control himself. What's happened? My mother rushes over to my side, murmuring concern and confusion. Jonathan, my father bites out, ignoring my mother as she grips his deputy's shoulder. Where is Tobias, Jonathan? Is he alive? Ashford shakes his head, and I'm not sure if he's going to say the boy suffered the same fate, or that he didn't know. I think he took my horse. He was gone. Dottie uttered the Mason Farm. My mother grabs onto my arm. When I look into her fearful, imploring gaze, all I can think of is Joe and Doyle, what he did to her in the alley, and what he might be doing to her right now. 
Chapter 34 Clayton I reach the Masons just after the sun rises, to find no unattended horses milling about outside the house or cause for alarm. The two men I've brought with me pull their horses to a halt in my dust wake. Joe, I call as I dismount from Jules. Mr. Mason? I pound on the front door only once before it opens. A sleepy-eyed boy is standing there. The little beggar I've seen around town a time or two. Tobias? He blinks at me. He's cleaner than I've noticed him before, and he has Ashford's brown eyes. Your father sent me to make sure you're all right, I tell him. Where's Joe? I step inside, the men waiting for me on the porch, hands braced on the handles of their pistols as they peer around. She rode off early this morning, Scarlet says, her voice a watery mess. She walks down the hall from the sitting room. Her hair is rumpled and her eyes red as if she's been crying. There was no stopping her. Clayton, Mr. Mason says with surprise, stepping out of the kitchen with a cup of something hot in his hand. The circles under his eyes tell me it's one cup of many. I glance between Scarlet and her father. Mr. Ashford came to my house an hour ago. He told us what happened. I look at Scarlet. He's okay. He's not injured. She chokes back a sob and turns away, crying into her hands. My father and his men are looking for Doyle. I came to make sure you were all okay. With renewed composure, Scarlet comes to stand behind Tobias and runs her fingers through his tawny brown hair. He peers up at her, then turns and limply walks into the sitting room. Scarlet and her father step closer. The boy saw everything, Mr. Mason explains, low and clipped. And what of Joe? Where did she go? I pray it wasn't into town. Not to the bookstore. No, Scarlet sniffles and lifts her verdant eyes, shimmering and red-rimmed to meet mine. She went in the direction of the cemetery. I turn for the door. I need to make sure she's all right. Be careful, Clayton, Mr. Mason says. Until this Doyle business gets straightened out, just be careful. I nod as Scarlet whispers my name, then she reaches for my arm. Take care of her. She blames herself for this. Why Joe would blame herself, I have no idea, but I need to see her for myself and to make sure she's in one piece. I eye my father's men. Stay with them. If you see Doyle, kill him on sight. I don't want him anywhere near this house. Yes, sir, they say in unison, and I brush past them and rush to my horse. I don't bother checking the cemetery. It's the train car I go to first. I push Jules hard, not because I'm worried about Doyle as much as I'm worried about Joe. When I finally reach the reinforced boxcar, my heart pumps a triumphant beat as Duke comes into view, tied up with his head hanging low in a sleepy daze. Jules trots over to him, and I fling my leg off before she comes to a complete stop. Haphazardly, I wrap her reins around an emaciated ironwood tree and turn toward the train car. The door is closed, with barely a crack to see through. Joe, I say softly, peering inside. She lifts her head from her knees, blinking. I heave my shoulder into the sliding door, expecting it to take all of my might to open like last time. But it slides easily. I oiled it. Joe's voice is a hoarse whisper, but she doesn't take her eyes off me. I'm not sure if she's happy to see me, surprised or angry, but I don't care. She swallows and licks her lips. What are you doing here? I scan her body, reassuring myself that Doyle hasn't touched her, then crouch down. Holding my breath, I take a piece of her bloodied white shirt between my fingers. It's Dottie's. She blinks, a faraway look in her eyes. Toby was covered in it. As her eyes fill with tears, and it appears she might break, I wrap my arm around her shoulders and pull her into me. I'm sorry, Joe. I know she was your friend. Joe's hands clutch my shirt as she sags against me, so I squeeze her tighter. I got her killed, she sobs, her hot tears dampening my chest. 
This was not you, Joe. It had nothing to do with you. Your father is punishing me for snooping around, for what I know. He's killed her to teach me a lesson. She twists my shirt in her hands, her body trembling. I've killed her. I grab hold of her shoulders, forcing her to look at me. Listen to me, I demand and stare into her hazel eyes, illuminated with pain and somehow dulled with defeat. This was not my father's doing. It was not a punishment. This was Doyle. It was all Doyle. She stares at me, nose red and wet, her lashes damp, and her eyes search mine. My father's lost control of him. Doyle's been doing his own bidding for a while now. It's why he would risk assaulting you, why he's been stealing. He thinks he can get away with all of this, Joe. But he won't, I swear to you. He won't. My father will see to that. I will see to that. She rasps and shudders and searches my face, but she doesn't say anything, and I wonder if she believes me, if she believes in me. Joe? Finally, she leans into me again and nestles her face against my chest. We will never be safe. That's not true. I promised you I would protect you, and I will. But Dottie didn't do anything. I swallow the thickness in my throat. The kind-faced woman will be sorely missed, and I wish there was something more I could do. I know she didn't, I whisper, and wrap my arms around her once more. But she saved Tobias's life. He might not have gotten away without her. But, Joe heaves, why would she even have to? Why try to hurt the boy? She shakes her head against my chest in utter disbelief. But that's the thing about power-hungry, greedy men like Doyle. They don't have to have a good reason to do something. Just the will to do whatever's necessary in order to get what they want. Knowing Doyle, what he wanted was revenge. Probably to punish Ashford for being my father's right-hand man, and in turn punish my father for what he did to Doyle's face once my father found out what Doyle had done to you. Joe's breath catches in her throat, but she doesn't look at me. Her breath is hot against my neck as she heaves in and out, and I brush the matted, loose hair away from her face as I rock her like I do for Izzy when she can't sleep. I'm here, I tell her, wishing she knew how desperately I want to take her pain away. I won't let anything else happen. We won't let Doyle hurt any more people. I squeeze my eyes shut and pray it's a promise I can keep. Joe takes a ragged breath, and we sit there on the blanket in the old, rotted train car for minutes, perhaps an hour, with nothing but her sobs to fill the silence. With her broken and crumbling in my arms, I know I will never be able to leave her again. Chapter 35, Joe. I'm not sure how many minutes pass, perhaps even hours, as my thoughts float further away, drifting in a numbed exhaustion as I listen to the steady beat of Clayton's heart. Thump, thump. Thump, 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 thump. It's easier than I imagined to relax into his warmth, to feel safe and comforted in his arms when only moments before I'd thought the world had finally taken all the strength I had left. Why did you come? I whisper, my throat sore from crying. His thumb pauses its slow circle on my shoulder. He's quiet a moment, unmoving, then his thumb continues its soothing rhythm. I had to make sure you were all right, he says softly. I wonder if it's emotion that makes the words sound strangled, or that his voice is rusty from disuse. When I'd heard what happened, I was sure he was coming for you, to finish what he'd started. I shake my head against his chest. I never even considered. I thought it was your father. I know. I thought it was because he knows that I know things, or because I pushed you away. He shakes his head, the stubble of his chin catching my hair. 
Doyle's responsible for what happened to your father's face the night of the engagement announcement, and for what happened to those two people you met by the water. Says who, your father? Even if I want to believe, Clayton, I can't help the incredulity in my voice. He tucks a strand of my hair behind my ear. Ashford, you are safe from my father, forever, I promise. He swore. The words seem so impossible, yet they feel so true and earnest. I don't expect you to believe this, he says tentatively, but he's miserable for what he's done. I've seen how it's eaten away at him. The marshal has haunted me my entire life, but only in the shadows of my memories. Every intricate detail seems to blur, every sinister look and underhanded remark. If it's all truly been in my head, then I don't know what to think anymore. I know it doesn't make it better, and you and I, neither of us, will ever forgive him for what he's done to you and your mother, but I think he is willing to spend what's left of his life protecting you in his own way as penitence. He loved your, I squeeze my eyes shut, he loved my mother too much not to, I say. Like nails biting into a fisted palm, my heart still aches at the thought of them together. Her a beautiful rose, him the vulture that plucks away at the petals until there's nothing left. But I know that's not true either. She was not innocent in all of it. She broke my father's heart, and mine. I splay my hand against Clayton's heart, wishing I could go back to the morning in the library, wishing I could unsay everything and remember him the way he was in his bedroom. Open, curious, smiling. I'm sorry about what I said, I whisper. Since that morning, all I can remember is coldness and regret, even if I don't even remember why anymore. Clayton kisses the top of my head and rests his cheek against my hair. I was visiting Dottie the night Doyle, the night you found me with him. She told me so many impossible things about my mother and your father and about Mr. Ashford. You were in the center of it all, a sick boy my mother wanted to save, your father a broken man who would do anything to have a semblance of his happiness back. I breathe into Clayton's shirt, inhaling his scent that I only ever remember in my dreams. My entire life has been a lie in so many ways. I don't know how to unfeel it. I don't know how to let it go. I shut my eyes and imagine a world where only Clayton and I exist like this. None of it is your fault, I know that. He kisses my forehead and we sit, embraced in each other's arms in silence. I don't know where his thoughts drift, but mine are a welcome blur. Finally, Clayton clears his throat. My father wanted us to marry to protect you from Doyle and save this town, he says. I wanted to marry you because I've never felt this way about someone. I was going to force you because I didn't want to let you go. His voice is full of a regret I don't understand. I unwrap myself from Clayton's arms and gaze into his bright blue eyes. So much emotion stirs in them, and I want to feel what he feels. His chest burns beneath my palm, his body a beacon of warmth and comfort and protection. I know he has feelings for me, or that he did, and I knew he wanted me in the same way I wanted him. But the ache in his voice is something else. It's more, and it fills me with hope. He brushes the moisture from beneath my lashes with his thumb and smiles sadly. Clayton's not his father. He's nothing like the marshal. A truth I've known but haven't been able to see until now. Leaning in, I press my lips to his. A wish, an apology, a promise. When I pull away, his eyes are closed and his brow furrows. I don't know if he's confused or angry and I fear the emotion he tries to keep at bay. With a swallow, I nestle back into him, hoping we can at least stay like this a little while longer. One of the horses sneezes outside, and a breeze whooshes through the cracked siding, brushing against my cheek. Does that mean we can start over? He finally asks. I smile, if only to myself, and nod against his chest. I would like that. Clayton's arms tighten around me again, and he lets out a ragged breath. He's dying, Clayton says, though I'm not sure who he's speaking of. 
my heartbeat quickens, and I lean away from him. His arms fall to his lap, and the warmth of him vanishes as he stares down at his hands. Thoughtfully, he runs his fingertips over the lines in his palm. I can't understand why he didn't tell me sooner. Your father? I breathe, and I swallow my surprise down deep, uncertain why I'm not more relieved to hear the words. Perhaps he didn't want to seem weak, or for you to worry, I offer. Though I know little about the inner workings of the marshal's mind, I can easily imagine the protective urge a father has for his son. He nods, though he doesn't seem certain. Perhaps. Though my mother's life was snuffed out, I have always regretted not telling her I loved her more or asking her questions when I wanted to. If you have something to tell him, things to ask or say, you should do it now. Once he's gone, Clayton nods and laces his fingers with mine. I shut my eyes and listen to the birds chirping and feel the warmth of the sun beginning to heat the inside of the train car. Thank you for coming to me, Clayton. I sigh as my mind lightens with relief. I can't imagine what sorry state I would be in right now, hating your father for this, if you hadn't come. Clayton plays with the hem of the blanket between his finger as his mind drifts somewhere. Then abruptly, he turns to face me fully, his knees touching mine. Starting over doesn't mean we have to get married. But these past two weeks, just knowing I couldn't speak to you, it's been unbearable. I don't want you to hate me for forcing our marriage, and I won't ever try again. But I do want you, Joe. He draws in a quick breath. I know my past sickens you, and I know you don't trust me, not completely. But I want to make you happy. I will do better and show you I am worthy of you. I swear it. His eyes implore me to believe him, and his mouth parts as his chest quickly rises and falls like there's more to say, but he hesitates. How many women have seen this desperate look in his eyes and yearned to feel his hands on them the way I do? How many women has he touched, explored, consumed? The very question has haunted me since the moment he twirled me on the dance floor and I thought I saw intrigue in his eyes. I don't hold your past against you, not really. I swallow, feeling my cheeks redden. But I'm not like the women you've been with. I don't know how- No he says, adamant, you are nothing like those women. I would never want you to be. His gaze is fierce and his jaw clenches as he shakes his head. Those women touched me because I paid them to, and they flattered me because it's what's expected. He spits each word out like a disgusting memory. I want you to be with me because you want to be, not because my father is forcing you or because I am, and I wish you didn't see what I was when you look at me or see my father. I want you to see me. I want you to want me. A vulnerability I've never seen before shadows his eyes, a desperation. Some soft, secret emotion stirs inside me, and I want the world to fade away from us, to strip us both of every burden and shadow. Hesitant, I reach for his face. His eyes never leave mine, never change. The moment the palm of my hand touches his cheek, his eyes close and the tension coiling inside his shoulders visibly disperses and he leans into my touch. I know you are not your father, I tell him. You are a far better man than he has ever been. His brow furrows and he opens his eyes, but I can only stare at his lips. I brush my thumb over the bottom one. The combination of dry, plump skin and the bristles that dust the skin around them stirs something warm in my blood. Needing to feel his mouth against mine again, to taste him the way I did the other night, I lean in and press my lips to his again, but more forcefully and urgent. Clayton's mouth parts as he inhales through his nose and kisses me back, slowly, confidently. It's as if he's savoring it. Doing the same, I explore his mouth, the way his tongue slides against mine, and revel in how his lips fit perfectly against mine. I pull away, licking his taste on my lips, wanting to imprint it to memory. When I blink my eyes open, Clayton is watching, 
his brow crinkled and drawn, but he says nothing. The pain and sincerity in his eyes chase away a lifetime of shadows. And I want us, here, in this place that's ours, to just be. I take in the planes of his face, the angle of his jaw, the crookedness of his nose, and every scar and imperfection that makes him beautiful. Though my mind races with nerves, my heart pulls me closer to him, and I know I will never forgive myself if I push him away again, no matter my fears and insecurities. Clayton's gaze shifts over me, frantic and questioning in my silence. I have lived in fear for so long, I don't want to fear being with Clayton, not in any way. Resolved to trust him, I inhale, tell myself that he cares for me, that he might even love me for what he's risked, and tug at the linen of his shirt. Clayton hesitates to lift his arms, and I raise an expectant eyebrow in answer. It's nothing I haven't seen before, I point out, and the corner of his mouth quirks. When he raises his arms, I pull his shirt over his head. His chest is more tempting than I remember it being in the darkness. Though his torso is not as tanned as the rest of him, his chest is broad and sprinkled with hair that is coarse and curls beneath my fingertips. His body frightens me as much as it fascinates me. Clayton sucks in a breath as my fingers travel over his chest and down to his belly button. Joe, he rasps, you have no idea what you are doing to me right now. Feeling a thrill of victory and sense of power, I smile. I can't help that I want to know every part of him, especially when I've already exposed the most haunting parts of myself to him. His stomach flinches against the lightness of my fingertips, and I pause when they stroke against a small white scar on his side. The marred skin is silky beneath my touch, unlike mine. From when I had pneumonia, he says softly, bringing me back to him. Your mother had to. He hisses another breath as I brush the scar with my fingertip again, realizing my mother left her mark on Clayton in many ways, too. Through his father, on Clayton's body, through me, neither of us are unscathed by their infidelity. Clayton's sides tremble as my fingertips trail lightly across his skin, and I gently press his shoulder back and lean down to kiss his scar, my mouth lingering over his sensitive skin. When strands of my hair cascade down onto his abdomen, he reaches for me. You need to stop, he warns. I don't want you to, clearly. He lets out a strangled laugh. But we both know I lack the control of a true gentleman. Smiling, I press my lips to his. But I don't want to stop. Clayton squirms uncomfortably, his chest heaving against mine in anticipation. Then something reckless kindles inside me. I kiss him more hungrily than before, more fervent and impatiently, and with a groan, Clayton pulls me into his lap. His lips travel from my mouth to my jaw, his hot breath leaving chills in its wake, behind my ear, down my neck, like he could never have enough of me. I grip his arms, feeling his body tremble with restraint and coiled with a need that makes my heart beat so fast I can't catch my breath. I don't want to. I want whatever spark that flickers inside me to burst to flame, and I pull him against me until there is no more air left between us. Clayton breaks away, heaving for breath as torment flashes in his eyes. Promise me you won't regret this when your senses return. I silently promise as I pull his mouth to mine again. I won't regret this. I could never regret this. I want him, all of him, scars and demons and all. I want to be beautifully broken with him and feel a connection to a living, breathing future, not a withered, desolate past. Clayton is a beacon in the storm as what ifs batter my mind. What if this is our only time together? What if I never feel this again? What if I could feel this way for the rest of my life? Deftly, Clayton loosens the buckles of my corset vest and it falls away. My blouse and trousers quickly follow, and he lays me down on the blankets, his leg a wedge between mine. 
His body presses against me, heavy in all the right places, until it's just his skin against mine. Then his warm hand trails over my shoulder. As his fingers brush over my scars, I gasp, but Clayton doesn't falter. His soft touch is unwavering, and in that moment, I know I've never felt so light or free, and I succumb to the man who has torn my world apart, and in doing so, he's made me feel whole again. Chapter 36 Clayton Joe's back presses against my chest, her scars soft and warm against me as her silhouette rises and falls. I tighten my hold around her, uncertain how this could be real. Kissing her neck, I breathe her in and wish the past hour would stretch for an eternity. But I know it has to end. I just hope it's not regret I see when I find the courage to look her in the eyes. Lifting onto my elbow, I peer down at her. Her long lashes blink open and shut lazily until she can no longer stand my watching her, and she smiles shyly up at me. She is perfection, and I hope she's mine forever. I kiss her shoulder and stroke her soft, sweat-dampened skin with my thumb as I contemplate the necklace in my pocket. I don't want to ruin this, I think aloud. Joe rolls onto her back, her eyes anxiously searching mine. What do you mean? I press my mouth to hers and suck her bottom lip between my teeth, feeling intoxicated with her so near. I kiss the corner of her mouth and her neck, inhaling the faded scent of lemon on her skin again. And when I pull away, her hazel eyes are smiling for the first time. We should go soon, I say regretfully. Your father and sister are worried about you, and I've already kept you here too long. She closes her eyes, her dark lashes fanning over tanned, slightly freckled skin, and she sighs. You're right. Sitting up, I hand Joe's undergarments to her before I pull my shirt over my head. She stands and begins to dress. Here, she says. And when she picks up my trousers, the pendant falls out of the pockets onto the floor. Joe stills and stares down at it. My necklace. Her breasts rise and fall as she tries to understand. She crouches down and takes it between her fingers. This is my necklace. She looks at me, her eyes wild with confusion. But where? What are you doing with it? My father had it. I explain. I wanted to give it back to you. Slowly, a small smile curves her lips, and she brushes her thumb over the butterfly. I thought I would never see it again. Joe, I say, climbing to my feet. I pull my trousers on over my hips and wait for her to look at me. Before you decide to keep it, her delight fades along with her smile. It was a gift to your mother, from my father. As I expected, her brow knits slightly, and she stares longingly at the butterfly again. He had it locked away in a drawer to remember her by. I took it, though I'm not sure you still want it. Joe's hand closes around the pendant, and she takes a hasty step toward me. I wait for her anger or sadness with bated breath, but instead, she presses her lips to mine. She wraps her arms around me and holds me against her. Thank you, she breathes into my ear, the warmth of her body and breath sending elation through me. She's still close. She's still mine. My mother gave it to me. I will want it always, no matter what. It's all I have left of her. When she pulls away, she brushes her hair out of her face and over her shoulder. The pendant rests perfectly against her chest as she clasps the chain around her neck. I'm glad to know I've done something right, I jest. With a wink, she turns her back to me so that I might tighten her corset. I fumble with the buckles as I tug it tighter, afraid to hurt her, when her laughter startles me.
You weren't having this much trouble when you were taking it off. Put some muscle into it. I won't break. With a final adamant tug, I earn a yelp from her, then another smile, and we gather the rest of our things. The ride home goes by too quickly. As soon as the Mason's Ranch comes into view, we slow down, trotting between the greenhouses and up the hill toward the front of the farmhouse. I should go see if my father needs any help with Doyle, I tell her, even though I don't want to leave. But when I realize my men aren't standing outside, I kick Jules into a gallop, rushing toward the house. When we reach the porch, one of my men is dead, a crimson puddle staining the wood beneath him, and I draw my pistol as I caution Joe to stay quiet atop her horse. She nods, fear shimmering in her eyes as I creep toward the house, and I listen for sounds inside. Other than the squeaking whirl of the windmill in the breeze, I hear nothing. I don't know where my other man is, but if I had to guess, he's one of Doyle's men and has betrayed me and my father. Or he's dead somewhere as well. I peer through the glare of the sun on the window into the kitchen and see nothing. Then I move to the entryway window, though inside appears dark. I nod for Joe to dismount, refusing to let her out of my sight, and I slowly and quietly open the front door. Should this all be some sort of trap Doyle set for me? I eye the entry and hallways as I step inside, then the landing. The floorboards creak as Joe steps in behind me, and we split up to search the house. I check the kitchen again, then the dining room and the sitting room, but there is no one. The house is too quiet, eerily so. Mr. Mason, I hedge, then hold my breath. Scarlet, Joe calls down the hall, her trepidation ringing in the silence. But no one answers. As I'm about to hurry up the stairs, Joe calls me from her father's study. She rushes into the hallway and hands me a note, her eyes wide with terror. It was on the floor, she says, her chin trembling. I tear my eyes away from her long enough to read the three scribbled words that fill me with dread. Come find me. There's a shuffle upstairs and I aim my pistol at the landing. He took them, says a small, familiar voice. Tobias comes into view and Joe cries out and runs to him. Are you okay? She pulls him into her arms as she reaches the top, then searches him for injuries. What happened? Scarlet hid me upstairs, but Doyle took them. Damn it, Doyle. I seethe and read the words over and over, wondering if they are meant for me, or my father, or Joe. We need to get more guns, more men. We need to figure out where he's taking them. Joe hurries down the stairs and throws open a secret door underneath the stairs, then pulls out a tiny pistol and tucks it into her waistband. She heaves a shotgun out, then another. I know exactly where they are. Chapter 37, Joe. Sandstone gives way to a dried up gulch as our horses clump up to the deserted mine camp, every one of us on high alert. It's as if even the horses know something villainous lurks in these mountains. They hold their heads high, their ears flicking and shifting as they strain to hear. I lean forward to pat Duke's withers, then look at Clayton. His profile is one of concentration and determination. This will work, I tell him. It has to. At least now we know what we're dealing with. Mr. Ashford's explanation of Doyle painted him just as crazy as he is dangerous, jealous of Clayton and desperate for power. He's always wanted to be Marshal. He thinks he deserves it. His father used to think that, too. He hates that Clayton is going to take over. And when the marshal beat his face to a bloody pulp after what he did to Joe, Doyle lost it completely. He's been plotting and planning ever since. I look at Clayton, worried that he's in as much danger as the rest of us, if not more. Doyle attacked me because I was to marry Clayton, and I register his words for what they really meant now. 
He wanted to ruin me before Clayton could. He wanted to beat him, to hurt him. Clayton glances at the shotgun strapped to my saddle and then to the one hidden between my breasts. I wink at him, earning a small smile in return, and I urge Duke forward a little faster. I scour the cliffs and path toward the mill, our plan looping in my mind. Keep them distracted. Give the marshal time to surround us. We've been over it a dozen times, along with me telling Clayton I will not stay behind no matter what. This is my family my life, and my town as much as anyone's. I'm done hiding. The moment we round the bend, the old mine comes into view. What's left of the mill butts up to the stream flowing behind it. Of course Doyle's lair would be here, with crevasses everywhere to hide in, water, and even his stolen goods filling the outbuildings. Eroded iron trolleys and sinking pots are scattered around, old cartwheels and chisel heads, what shacks haven't collapsed over the years are missing windows and doors, though I don't miss the well-worn path leading to three squat buildings with reinforced siding and boarded-up windows. I have no idea how much Doyle has stashed in them, but none of it belongs to him, not anymore. The water mill stands tall and motionless at the entrance of the mine, its umber siding long turned to rot and its roof riddled with corrosion, though it's less formidable now than in my memories. The mill and mines send a surge of apprehension through me. This place is a cesspit of sordid deeds and death, when it could also be a beacon of hope and the restoration of sagebrush. Four men step out from behind one of the outbuildings, guns aimed at us. Then another five appear on the cliffs above us. There's a dozen of them scattered on either side. Knowing they hadn't been able to get into the garrison, or perhaps they hadn't even tried, I wonder how much ammunition and guns they actually have at their disposal. Enough to kill us, I'm certain. And I wonder how many more men wait for us inside. Another dozen? Twenty? Glad you could make it, the tallest of them says as he holsters his gun. There's no reason to aim it at us, not with all the others pointed directly at us. We were getting a little antsy waiting for you, he says, glancing between me and Clayton though you're one person short. His smile unsettles me, as it's meant to, but I try not to show it. They're all covetous, grasping snakes who care nothing for anyone but themselves. Are we? Doyle's note wasn't clear. Clayton drawls, unfazed by their menacing scowls. Something you would know if you could read. The man snarls and takes a step closer to me, his eyes locked on Clayton. That's enough, I scold them distract them, stall them, test their resolve. Whatever Doyle has in store for us, it's much more satisfying for him than a simple death, and I know his men won't hurt us. It would defeat the purpose of this charade. I look at the taller man, the ugly one in charge, who I've seen hanging around outside the saloon. He's not a deputy, he's a fiendish drunk, and just as mad as Doyle, if the gleam in his eyes is anything to go by. I'm just here to get my father and sister. We'll do whatever Doyle wants. Just take me to them, now. It takes a moment for the man to adjust his scowl and look away from Clayton. His hollow eyes narrow on me as he scans my body from booted toe to must pulled back hair. He said you were feisty. I like it when they're feisty. My skin crawls, but I scowl back at him. Mark my words, you rot-gutted worm. I grind out. When this is done, you will be dead, and you will never put your swollen, grubby hands on any woman ever again. His lips pull into a sneer. Do you both want to die? He shouts. I will gut you both. Winton, Doyle shouts from inside the mill, exactly where we'd hoped he would be. He steps into the doorway. That's no way to speak to our guests. A dozen more men appear behind him and file out, pistols and shotguns in their hands as they flank him on either side. I thought the old mine was appropriate, Miss Mason, he says, pure enjoyment ringing in his words. Brings back fond memories, doesn't it? My men will show you in. He nods at Wenton and turns to head back inside. What is it you want from us? I shout, and Doyle stops mid-step. My father is too important for you to kill, and my sister has done nothing to you. 
I have done nothing to you. Wenton hovers next to me, waiting for another command from Doyle as he straddles the doorway. Slowly, Doyle peers over his shoulder. To know what all the fuss is about, he practically seeds. Though I was hoping you would bring me the marshal, too. He peers around the cliffs with disappointment. Where's he at? You miscalculate if you think my father cares what happens to the Masons, Doyle. Doyle and his men burst into laughter. You think I'm a fool? Doyle barks. Get them inside, now. Then he disappears through the doorway. You're a coward, Doyle. Clayton practically seethes. You want my father dead? You want me dead? Do it yourself. He shakes his head and laughs humorlessly to himself. What did you promise these men that my father can't give them? One of the men reaches for me, but I kick his hand away. Doyle stomps into the doorway again and cocks his pistol, aiming it at Clayton. He shoots, and I jump as the bullet screeches through the air and hits the boulder behind us. Shut the fuck up, he shouts, and I can see the spittle spurting from his mouth a few yards away in the sunlight. Your father cares more about this one here than his own daughter, he points his gun at me. You're all a blight and I'm gonna make him watch as I rid myself of every last one of you. He points his pistol at Wenton next in warning. I said get them inside. I want to know my father and sister are still alive. I rush the words out, stalling as he disappears inside the mill again. Once I go in there, I might never come out. You might as well kill me right now because I will not budge. I will fight and scream and maim these men until I know that my family is safe. Have it your way, Doyle sings from inside the mill. Scarlet screams immediately after from inside, and my heart pumps more violently than a steam engine. Scarlet! Wenton pulls me down from my horse, and I don't resist him, though it takes everything in me not to. Find them, get them somewhere safe, and let the others do the rest. When my feet hit the dirt, the cool metal of Wenton's gun presses into the back of my neck, and I squeeze my eyes shut. Don't move an inch, Wenton warns me. A deputy a few feet from me aims his pistol at my head, and Wenton leans in, his sweaty body rubbing against me. Get your filthy hands off her, Clayton demands, but Wenton laughs and presses his chest against my back. His arms snake out in front of me to grab my breasts, and I freeze with worry that he might find the hidden muff pistol. Supple, he says approvingly though I prefer gingers. I pray Scarlet is untouched, and I force myself to bide my time and bite my tongue as his hands move down my body in search of weapons. Not very strategic, are you? He says, and I hold my breath, waiting for him to find it, but he doesn't. Then I hear the buckle clink of my shotgun strap on my saddle. Wenton pushes his pistol to the back of my head again. Let's go. Chapter 38, Joe. Get them somewhere safe and let the others do the rest. I repeat the plan over and over as I draw closer to the mill door. There is little I remember about this place, having been either unconscious or encased in darkness most of the time, so I take in whatever my overwhelmed senses will allow. Oh, what's this? One of the men says behind me and I hear the clank of Clayton's pistols against one another as they unarm him. When the fleshy thump of fist against flesh reaches my ears, I wrench myself from Wenton's hold, needing to see that Clayton's okay. Two men lift their fists to hit him in the side of his face, once, twice, until Clayton stumbles forward and I see blood drip from his mouth. You're not so scrappy now, are you? One of them begins to bind Clayton's hands, and he allows it, either because he's too stunned or because he knows he must. Wenton grabs me to hurry me forward, but I stomp on his foot and tear my arm from his grip to run to Clayton. Wenton's elbow hits the base of my neck, and I fall to my knees. Stupid bitch. My head pounds like a hammer forging metal as I try to shake the blow away, and I groan. I'm going to enjoy your sweet little sister a bit more now, I think. Wenton pulls me to my feet again, his fingers biting into my upper arm as he pushes me through the doorway. 
The inside of the mill isn't barren as I'd expected, but a lair, a throne room. And Doyle sits in a high-backed chair, grinning at me. Welcome, he says, and gestures to the bench in front of the millstone across from him. Please, have a seat. Your betrothed will be with us shortly. Well, maybe not. He leans over the arm of his chair and peers outside. It looks like they're having a bit of fun with him. Doyle taunts me, but when I spot Scarlet and my father gagged and bound in the corner of the space, I pale. Both of their faces are bloodied and their eyes are wide and worried, but they're alive at least. My chest heaves with relief, and I take stock of the dozen men that stand around the wood-paneled room. Some watch the exterior through the single window that faces the mine shafts, their guns at their sides as they wait for approaching danger. The rest of them are jobless, only here for Doyle's protection, and they look bored. Why is she not bound? Doyle shouts at Wenton. Tie her up, damn it. If you want a slice of the fortune, do your damn job. It's simple. I was hoping my bindings would go unnoticed, but when I don't feel Wenton's hands on me, I look over my shoulder at him. Two guns are pointed on me, but Wenton is staring blankly at Doyle. Well, Doyle prompts, his gun swinging at his side as he lifts his shoulders. What are you waiting for? I said bind the bitch. I, uh, I don't have anything to bind her hands with. Doyle jumps to his feet, a murderous look on his face as he stomps over to us. Get out of here, he growls, sweat on his brow. He takes my wrist in his hand. Leave us. Get out there and watch for the marshal with the others. I know he's coming, and I don't want him to miss this. An unspoken threat passes between Doyle and Wenton until Wenton relents and retreats out the door. My eyes linger on my disheveled sister and my father. He looks older in this broken place. It feels unreal that only hours ago I was safe and happy in Clayton's arms, and now this. Why do you think the marshal will come for me? I ask, swallowing my fear. It's Clayton he cares about, his heir. Cut off your laces, he says to one of his men. That's who you really want to hurt, isn't it, Doyle? What do I have to do with anything? Doyle's mouth draws up in a devilish grin as his man hands him his shoelace to tie around my wrists. Oh, sweet cheeks, I know the marshal will come. He jerks me around, one of the men at the window settling his gun on me as Doyle tightens the strings until my skin burns. That's the problem with the marshal, he continues. He's old and soft, and he's getting too predictable. This town is sinking in its own piss and shit, and he's the one we have to thank for it. A shot cracks through the air outside, and Doyle crouches down, tugging me over to the millstone. Cover the windows and the doors, he commands. He shoves me behind the stone and crouches beside me, using it as a shield. Though I'm tied up, I'm closer to Scarlet. Her eyes widen and tears stream down her face, but I shake my head, wishing she could see the plan as it unfolds in my mind, even if I'm not certain we'll make it that far. How many are there? Doyle barks. Less than a dozen, maybe, says a man at the window across the room. They're in the cliffs. I can't see any of them. That means Doyle's men are dead in the cliffs, most of them anyway, and I'm grateful for what remains of the marshal's loyal deputies and their brutality. There's another crack outside, the echo filling the air. The men outside holler and shout indistinctly, but it's only a breath of time before more gunshots ring out and one of the men at the window falls down dead. Doyle curses. I don't care who's with him. Kill the deputies, but leave the marshal alive. I hear a shotgun this time, and I wonder if Doyle's men are using mine. I can't see Clayton. I don't know if he's taken cover somewhere or if he's already been shot, but I can't think about that. Not when I should be coming up with a plan to get free so I can get Scarlet and my father out of here alive. They're the only reason I'm here to begin with. They cower in a heap on the floor, wincing with each piercing screech. And when my father's eyes meet mine, I nod to the corner of the room near me praying they understand my meaning. Another shotgun goes off, and the men outside shout and gurgle as some of them cry in pain. One of the bullets ricochets through the mill, splintering pieces of the wood paneling to the ground. How many? 
Doyle shouts as another bullet breaks through the wall, more splinters raining down on us, distracting everyone as Scarlet and my father crawl the best they can into the corner behind me. I want Doyle to die, a bullet to hit him right between the eyes, but he cowers like any coward would beside me, and I know I will have to draw him out into the open or kill him myself if he's going to die before this fight is over. Another of Doyle's men at the window shrieks and falls dead. Gunfire intensifies. The sound of a thunderstorm drumming on a metal roof is all I can hear. And then, it's quiet. One breath. Two breaths. Doyle, the marshal roars from outside. Get your sorry ass out here. I told you he'd come, Doyle laughs. There's a measure of fear in his eyes, but I see excitement too. For the first time in my entire life, I silently cheer at the sound of the marshal's voice. Only two men are left at the window, crouched out of sight. They're not like the marshal's men, they're cowards. Doyle picked a sorry lot to do his bidding and he knows it. He frantically glances around at how few of them are standing and the laughter in his eyes dies away. He licks his lips, eyes scouring the walls as if he's searching for more options. Doyle shoves his gun into my temple and pulls me to my feet. If you want your precious masons, come and get them, Marshal, he shouts. Most of Doyle's men are lying on the floor, blood splattered and gone from this world, save for the few remaining. He's outnumbered now, I know that much. He glares at two of the cowards beneath the window. If something happens to me, kill them, he nods to my father and sister. And though the gunmen nod, I hope they're too frightened of the marshal and the fact that he has the upper hand now to comply. I said, come and get her, Doyle shouts again, and I feel his breath against the back of my neck. I'm unarmed, Doyle, the marshal says, his voice drawing closer. There's a ruckus outside, arguing and grumbling, but the marshal barks an adamant, no, and the whispers cease. See? Doyle seethes against my ear. He won't let them do anything to risk your life. He's too predictable. The marshal's shadow precedes him in the doorway, and when he steps into view, his hands are up in surrender. He looks at me first, then he finds my sister and father in the corner. What are you doing, Doyle? He looks confused, but sounds disappointed. What do you think? I'm taking over sagebrush. What makes you think anyone will follow you, I ask. Shut the hell up, Doyle says, and presses the barrel of his pistol into my temple again. The marshal purses his lips, his eyes wide as I shriek in pain, and he takes a step closer. That's far enough, marshal. Doyle peeks around him. Who else do you have out there? The marshal lifts his dark, bushy eyebrow daringly. Why don't you take a step outside and look for yourself? Doyle laughs. That's funny, but I don't think so. Get them to their feet, he shouts at the two men by the window, nodding to my sister and father. If you want me, Doyle, the marshal shouts, stepping closer, then kill me. Doyle twitches at the marshal's words. I feel him shake as if he's a scared little boy. I wonder if it's the fear of dying or the respect he has for the marshal that teeters on hate. The marshal takes a step forward more briskly this time. I said, stay the fuck back, Doyle shouts, stay back. But the marshal keeps moving, then reaches into his coat. Stop, Doyle shouts, I said, stop. And he pulls the trigger. The marshal's eyes widen, his body wavering before he falls to his knees. My heart stops as the marshal blinks, barely smiles, and tosses a knife toward my feet. Doyle hits himself in the head with his palm as he steps closer. I told you to stop, goddammit, he shouts hysterically. Two more shots are fired outside, closer this time, and the two men moving by the window fall dead. I crouch for the knife, struggling to get it in my grasp before I can finally pick it up. I scramble over to my sister so she can try to cut my ropes free. Tears sting my eyes as I realize this is the chance the marshal gave me the only one I have, and I have to save them. Scarlet frantically saws at the shoestring, and when it falls free, I sob with happiness and reach for the muff pistol in my shirt and aim it at Doyle. He's rubbing his head, 
peering around, shocked and in mourning at the same time as he stares at the marshal, whose mouth hangs open before he collapses in a thump to the ground. His eyes are fixed on mine, his directions clear. When Doyle turns to look at me, I shoot him. Once, twice. I pull the trigger again, but nothing comes. Two bullets, I only had two bullets. Doyle looks at me, confused for a moment, before he finally falls to the ground beside the marshal. I hold my breath, worried he won't die. Joe, Clayton shouts from outside, uncertain who's alive inside. Joe, I'm, my voice is rusty. I'm here, I say louder, and I watch Doyle take a few staggering breaths before his fingers twitch no more. Clayton and a group of others inch into the doorway, their guns at the ready. Mr. Trainer and Mr. McGregor, Ms. Hannah May and Mr. Ashford. Scarlet garbles something, and I shake my mind awake again and run to her. I pull the gag from her mouth, her hands still tied behind her back. Help him, she shouts, nodding to our father. He was shot in the crossfire. Blood splatters his shirt, and I try not to panic as I untie him. I'm fine, he breathes, but his face is pallid and he's losing a lot of blood. Mr. Ashford runs over to Scarlet. Are you all right? His voice breaks. I was, Scarlet, I interrupt. My heart is racing, adrenaline seizing every thought and movement. I need you to put pressure on his gunshot. I meet her watery gaze. Don't let up until I say, I tell her. Mr. Ashford's arms fall from around her. His eyes are wide and a bit wild, but he looks at me and waits for a command. We need one of the horses, I tell him, and we need to get his wound cleaned and stop the bleeding. He nods without a question and rushes for the door, pausing for only a moment by Clayton, kneeling on the floor with his father in his arms. Chapter 39 Clayton My father lies helpless in my arms and Miss Hannah, the butcher, and others stand around us as his eyes slowly shift around, dulling as the life drains from them. Move, please, Joe says and kneels down beside me. He inhales a ragged breath and looks at her without saying a word. Thank you, she whispers, and something passes between them, though my eyes veer back to the two bullet holes in his chest. All I can do is register that this horrible man is dying, and I am sad. I love him, because he's my father. His eyes shift to me, and I wonder how much longer he has. How many seconds, how many breaths. He coughs and a gurgle of blood drips from the corner of his mouth. And, strangely, I think this is what he wanted. Death was coming for him anyway, though it does nothing to lessen the sting. Tears burn my eyes, and when I look to Joe, silently pleading for her to help him, her eyes are filled with tears as well. She shakes her head with regret. Tightening my grip on his hand, I lower my forehead to his. I'm sorry. He can barely utter the words. Joe clasps my arm and stays with us until my father takes his final breath and his hand slackens in mine. I think of my mother's face when I tell her he's gone. I think of the father Izzy no longer has. I regret that I spent so much time pushing my responsibilities away when I could have been helping him and I begin to sob. Chapter 40, Joe. I stare at my reflection in the mirror, the light filtering in from the window, filling the confined washroom. The eyes peering back at me are those of a woman much changed over the past month. But even as the Marshall, Doyle, and Dottie flood my mind, I know this new life of ours has only just begun. The moment Clayton and I step out into the room, everything will be different. I stare down at my burgundy dress, 
sophisticated but simple. The proper attire for a woman of such prominence, Scarlet said. I fan myself a moment, wondering what I've gotten myself into and how I might be able to get out of it. Being Clayton's bride is one thing, but his equal in all of this? I never even considered it, let alone thought it was possible. The voices in the ballroom grow louder, and with a final exhale, I open the door and hurry into the dressing room. I knock quietly and peek my head inside. Clayton? He stands at the window, his frame filling it, his posture rigid. Determined to be the epitome of calm and collected, I walk up to him and drape my arm over his shoulder. I follow his gaze out the window to the mountains, to the people who live there and the potential danger that brews in our future. Everything looks different now, doesn't it? I ask him. This past week has been fraught with pain and discovery, and yet it feels like a lifetime has already passed. He nods. Everything is different now. Everything will be better, I remind him. You'll see. When I peer into his eyes, they are clear and focused, though he worries the inside of his cheek, giving himself away. I turn him to fully face me, gazing into those blue pools of love and affection I've come to rely on. We're doing the right thing, I remind him, and snaking my arms around his neck, I rise up on tiptoes to kiss his lips. His face is freshly shaven and he smells of sweet grass. Clayton parts his lips and kisses me back with more ferocity than I expect. After a deep inhale, he breaks away and rests his forehead against mine. I know it's strange, but it feels like he should be here. I shake my head. It's not strange. A week ago he would have been, but you have your mother and sisters. A week ago I wouldn't be preparing to walk out there to address the entire town. He shakes his head. I'm no politician, Joe. He kisses the back of my hand and steps toward the door. I don't want to keep them waiting. I'm surprised they've waited this long to hear from me. Mr. Ashford has their ear, and that's to your advantage. He will be a great asset to you, and a good friend, I think. Now that everyone will know the truth of things, this is your chance to set everything right. It's you they will listen to, he says. I force a laugh. Me, the reclusive Mason girl? No, you the vanguard and harbinger of truth, not to mention the most fetching woman alive in your new fancy dress. I blush a little and take in his fitted trousers, then walk over to fix the collar of his damask vest. I liked the untamed leather look, I admit, lifting an eyebrow, but this suits you too. His mouth curls up in a slight smile, and I take his hands in mine. I kiss him again quick but fervent. Shall we? We walk to the door, the chatter of the energetic townspeople swelling as we open the door. I squeeze Clayton's hand tighter and we step out into the open room. Mr. Ashford and a few other deputies, the only ones he would trust, flank both sides of the small stage as Clayton leads me up to the pastor's lectern. The crowd immediately quiets and all eyes are fixed on us, uncertain and expectant. Clayton's mother, my father, and our sisters sit in the front row with Toby and the trainers. Mrs. Pelly is there, and Ms. Hannah May, and some of her ladies. The butcher and his wife are there, the milliner and Ms. Maddie. Everyone we know is part of the crowd that overflows into the streets on a summer day that will forever change Sagebrush. Ladies and gentlemen, Clayton starts, people of Sagebrush, the past decade has been the harshest yet and the past weeks have been earth-shattering for some, me included. I'm not just talking about the death of my father, a man loved by some but hated by most. I'm talking about our township being built on lies and governed by deceit, and at the crux of it all were men who thought themselves better than the rest of us. But I am here to tell you that as of today, if you choose to elect me as your new marshal, things will be different. Everyone will have the same access to water. Everyone will contribute to the greater good. And everyone will have a voice in what happens here, no matter their bloodline, no matter their annual income. The crowd murmurs with questions, and I resist a smile at their genuine surprise. Clayton pulls his notes from his pocket. Please excuse me, he says, his voice deeper and more formal than I'm used to. This is my first speech, as I'm sure you can tell. It's a little daunting. 
Some of the people chuckle, and Clayton scans his notes briefly before he peers out at the crowd again. After the shift, the world changed, and the pioneers of this town were lucky enough to survive a devastated world, one which landed us out here, tucked away from the rest of civilization. Now, I've spoken to men who have worked under my father. I have learned what they know, and I can tell you one thing for certain. You have been lied to time and again. We all have. There is life beyond the dead lands, more than thieves and vagabonds. We are not the only civilization left, a truth that has been kept from us for almost 200 years. What's worse, the men before us have killed these survivors, hunted them down and stolen from them. They have angered these people and made them our enemies. Anxious chatter fills the room again, and Clayton raises his hand to silence them. There is much to be done if we want to not only live but thrive here. There is much to do if we want to keep surrounding communities from retaliating after our acts of aggression that have worsened in decades past. None of us are warriors. We can't go to war, shouts Dr. Henderson. I'm not asking you to fight a war, Clayton clarifies, his patience wavering, and I squeeze his hand. I am telling you that there is danger, that we have to act, we have to be ready and I am willing to help us fix the corruption left in the wake of my father and his men, of the Cunninghams and Marshals before them. I'm asking that you elect me as your mayor, and that we elect others to serve as council so that we might have a united voice for the people of this town. There is clearly much to do, both on the home front and afar, so I will need the council's help prioritizing. A town cannot be run justly or efficiently by a single man, we know this from experience. He looks to me and I swallow thickly. I take a step forward and meet the eyes of the unnerved crowd. We have discussed numerous plans, I tell them, all of which we will discuss with the council before making any decisions. To start with, we want to utilize our land, use wind-powered turbines to pump water back into our homes, utilize the mill again to grind our grain, and build steam engines to dig for more coal. I know it's been outlawed in the past, but we will be smarter this time. We will heed the lessons of our ancestors. We can't keep stripping the lands around us, terrorizing others for what we need in order to survive. We must be able to sustain ourselves, and we can't do that as we are now. Most importantly, we want to dispatch peacekeeping committees to the villages we've already turned against us. We want to show them that we want peace now. None of this will happen overnight but it must be done, and we will be working to change our fate together. I give the people a moment to process the plans, what we're asking them to be a part of, knowing full well many of them will resist. When I look at my father, his eyes are shimmering and his mouth lifts in the corner. Toby is bored, picking at his tailored short suit as Scarlet sits beside him, tears streaming down the fading bruises of her cheeks as she smiles at me. Clayton clears his throat and commands the room again. So you have a decision ahead of you. Two weeks from now, we will hold elections for mayor and for city council members. We will post more information tomorrow, as well as have an open forum after church for you to come and ask any specific questions you might have. But for today, that is all. While I might not be officially elected as mayor yet, I still have a mound of marshal duties awaiting me on my desk, he says. And though it's no joke, some people laugh. Feel free to go to your ration stations as you please. No one will stop you. Take care of your families and take time to consider what we've told you. The days ahead are uncertain, but I'm confident that we'll get through them as we always seem to, but with more effectiveness now, if we're united. Clayton takes my hand and squeezes it in his, and the room booms with animated conversation. We walk down from the stage and I let out a steadying breath, feeling instantly better the moment my feet touch the ground. Scarlet throws her arms around me. I can't believe this is all so real, she says. It's still sinking in. Mrs. Cunningham winks at me as she pulls Clayton in to kiss his cheek. Kitty nods, her eyes no longer red-rimmed from crying, and she offers me a small, and if I'm not mistaken, congratulatory, smile. Isabel, downcast and missing her father, runs to Clayton and wraps her arms around his waist. When I meet my father's gaze, 
when I see the shine in his eyes and his busted lip, my own eyes begin to blur. He wraps his arm around my shoulders and squeezes me closer. Your mother would be very proud of you, he croaks, then kisses my forehead. We comment on the number of people and gauge initial reactions to news we've been wading through over the past week. People quickly file out, and it isn't long before we're making our way outside the hall doors. The sun is blinding at first, but there's a cool breeze in the air that helps calm what nervous energy remains. Come, Mr. Ashford says, let's get you home. He kisses Scarlet's temple. She smiles and takes Toby's hand in hers. Can we go to the stream? He asks. Scarlet laughs. On the coolest day of summer, you finally want to bathe? She teases him. Mr. Ashford looks to Clayton. First thing tomorrow then? Yes, tomorrow. I'll meet you at the garrison. Clayton rubs the bridge of his nose. I'm not even sure where to start. Clayton, Kitty calls. She points toward the mountains. A sandstorm. I glance from the watchtower to the man with the spyglass, then back to the storm. Get home, Clayton says to his mother and sisters. Get to the carriage. Tell Ainsley to hurry. Squinting, I stare at the mountains. The sky is dense and dark and different than any storm I've ever seen. It's close, I realize. Yes, I know, Joe. Come on. Clayton takes my hand as cold air whips through my hair and chills ripple down my spine. The air is moist. Wait. I stare at the pending black clouds and don't dare hope as I take a step closer. The clouds spotting the sky are gray and casting the afternoon in a gloomy haze. What is it? Clayton asks, stepping up beside me. You're acting mad. I look at him, barely able to contain my smile. I think it's rain. The End This has been Dust and Shadow, a Forgotten Lands novel, written by Lindsay Pogue, narrated by Avon Shore and Andrew Gibson. Copyright 2017 by Lindsay Pogue. Production copyright 2021 by Lindsay Pogue. Well, I hope you enjoyed this installment in the Forgotten Lands series. As always, I have linked to all the books in the series below in my suggested but not required reading order for your listening ease. Also, if you have not heard me talk about it yet, there is a sister series called The Ruin Lands that will not currently be available at the time of recording this on YouTube due to contract reasons. However, that won't always be the case. So whenever that changes, I will be sure to link to The Ruin Lands below. The Ruin Lands is also a weather ravaged world and series. And it takes place overseas in a little reimagined place that I call Norseland and another little reimagined place I call New London. It's gritty, it's dystopian, it's historical flair, lots of adventure, a little bit of love story. You know the drill by, by now. So I'll go ahead and link to all that below in case you're interested in checking them out. Also, I have been getting some questions from listeners about my stories, about my characters, and pretty much everything in between. So if you have a burning question for me about a world I've created or a character that you loved, go ahead and put it in the comments because I'm going to start a new video series if I haven't already. Don't know what it's going to be called yet, but I'm going to be answering reader questions because why not? So go ahead and leave it in a comment and I'll be sure to add it to the list. Don't forget, between audiobooks, you are more than welcome to join my rogue reader community where I have weekly updates, excerpts, and that sort of thing of whatever I'm currently working on. All right, without further ado, thank you to those of you for your super thanks. Every dollar that I get from all of you goes towards my next audiobook production. So I appreciate all of you very, very much. And I will see you on the next audiobook. Happy listening adventures.